So do you think death, mortality is fundamental to an agent? Mm. So like there's a, I don't know if you're familiar, there's a philosopher named Ernest Becker who wrote The uh, Denial of Death. And uh, his whole idea, and there's folks, psychologists, cognitive scientists that work on terror management theory. And they think that one of the special things about humans is that we're able to sort of foresee our death, right? We can we can realize not just as animals do, sort of constantly fear in an instinctual sense, respond to all the dangers that are out there, mm -hmm. but like understand that this ride ends eventually. Yeah. And that in itself is the most is a is the force behind all of the creative efforts of human nature. Yeah. That's that's the philosophy. I think that makes sense. A lot of sense. I mean animals probably don't think of death the same way, but humans know that your time is limited and you want to make it count. Um, and you can make it count in many different ways, but I think that has a lot to do with creativity and the need for humans to do something beyond just surviving. Uh, and now going from that simple definition to something that's the next level, I think that that could be the second decision, uh, a second level of definition that um, intelligence means something that you do something that stays behind you. That's more than uh, your uh, existence. Um, something you create something that um, is useful for others, is useful in the future, not just for yourself. And I think that that's a nice definition of intelligence in a next level. Uh, and it's also nice because it doesn't require that they are humans or biological. They could be artificial agents that are intelligence. They could they could achieve those kind of goals. So a particular agent. The uh, the ripple effects of of their existence on the entirety of the system is significant. So like they leave a trace where the, there's like a yeah like ripple effects. It's the but see then you go back to the the butterfly with the flap of a wing and then you can uh, trace a lot of uh, like nuclear wars and all the conflicts of human history somehow connected to that one butterfly that created all of the of the chaos. So maybe that's not may, maybe that's a very poetic way to think. Uh, th that's something we humans in a human centric way want to hope we have this impact. Like that is the, the, the secondary effect of our intelligence. We've had a long lasting impact on the world, but maybe the entirety of physics in the universe has a very long lasting effect. <laughs> sure. But um, you can also think of it. What if um, like the wonderful life, what if you're not here? Will yeah. somebody else do this? Uh, is it uh, is it something that you actually contributed because you had something unique to compute that that to contribute? That's a pretty high bar, though. <laughs> uniqueness. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you have to be Mozart or something to to actually reach that level. That nobody would have developed that, but other people might have solved this equation um, if you didn't do it. Um, but but also within limited scope. I mean, during your lifetime or next year, um, you could contribute something that unique that other people did not see. And um, and then that could change the way things move forward for a while. Uh, so I don't think we have to be Mozarts to be called intelligence, but we have this local effect that is changing. If, if you weren't there, that would not have happened. And it's a positive effect, of course. You want it to be a positive effect. Do you think it's possible to engineer in to uh, computational agents, a fear of mortality? Like, uh, does that make mm. any any sense? So there's a very trivial thing where it's like, you could just code in a parameter, which is how long the life ends, but more of a fear of mortality, like awareness of the, the way that things end and somehow encoding a complex representation of that fear, which is like, maybe as it gets closer, you become more terrified. Mm. I mean, at, there seems to be something really profound about this fear that's not currently encodable in a trivial way into our programs. Mm. Well, I think you're you're referring to the emotion of, of fear, something, because we are cognitively, we know that we have limited lifespan and most of us cope with it by just, hey, that's what the world is like <laughs> and I make the most of it. But so, sometimes you can have a, like a, uh, a fear that's not healthy, uh, that, that paralyzes you, that you can't do anything. Uh, and and uh, somewhere in between there, not caring at all and, and, and getting paralyzed because of fear is a normal response, which is a little bit more than just logic and, and it's mm -hmm. uh, emotion. So now the question is, what good are emotions? I mean, they are quite 
uh, complex and there are multiple dimensions of emotions and they probably do serve a survival function. Uh, heightened focus, for instance. Uh, and fear of death might be a really good emotion when you are in danger, that you recognize it, even, even if it's not logically necessarily easy to derive and you don't have time for that logical deduction, uh, deduction you may be able to recognize the situation is dangerous and this fear kicks in and you all of a sudden perceive the facts that are important for that. And I think that's generally is the role of emotions. It's, it's, it allows you to focus what's relevant uh, for your situation. And I, maybe if fear of death plays the same kind of role, uh, but if it consumes you and it's something that you think in normal life when you don't have to, then it's not healthy and then it's not productive. Yeah, but it's fascinating to think how to uh, incorporate emotion into a, a computational agent. It almost seems like a silly statement to make, but um, I, it perhaps seems silly because we have such a poor understanding of the mechanism of uh, emotion, of fear, of... Uh, I think at the core of it is another word that we know nothing about, but say a lot, which is consciousness. Yeah. Where does death come into that? So being is forgetting. I mean, the, the the concept of time completely. There's a there's a sense to doing and becoming that has a deadline and built in, the urgency, built in. Do you think death is fundamental to this, to a meaningful life? Uh, acknowledging, or um, feeling the terror of death, like Ernest Becker. Or just acknowledging the uncertainty, the mystery, the the melancholy nature of the fact that the ride ends? Is that part of this equation? Or it's not necessary? It, okay, we look at how it could be related. I've experienced fear of death. I've also experienced times where I thought I was going to die. It felt extremely peaceful and beautiful. And... Um, <laughs> It's funny because if we we can be afraid of death because we're afraid of hell or bad reincarnation or the bardo or some kind of idea of the afterlife we have where we're projecting some kind of sentient suffering. But if we're afraid of just non-experience, I notice that every time I stay up late enough that I'm really tired, I'm longing for deep, deep sleep and non-experience, right? Like I'm actually longing for experience to stop. And... It's not morbid. It's not a bummer. It's and and I don't mind falling asleep. And I sometimes when I wake up, want to go back into it. And then when it's done, I'm happy to come out of it. So um, when we think about death and having finite time here, and we could talk about if we live for a thousand years instead of a hundred or something like that, it would still be finite time. The one bummer with the age we die is that I generally find that people mostly start to emotionally mature just shortly before they die. Um, but um, there's, if I get to live forever, I, I can just stay focused on what's in it for me forever. And if life continues and consciousness and sentience and people appreciating beauty and adding to it and becoming continues. My life doesn't, but my life can have effects that continue well beyond it. Then life with a capital L starts mattering more to me than my life. My life gets to be a part of and in service to. And the whole thing about when old men plant trees, the shade of which they'll never get to be in. Um, I remember the first time I read this poem by Hafez, the the Sufi poet written in like the 13th century or something like that. And he talked about that if you're lonely to think about him and he was kind of leaning his spirit um, into yours across the distance of a millennium and would comfort you with these poems. And I, he was thinking about people a millennium from now and caring about their experience and what they'd be suffering if they'd be lonely and could he offer something that could touch them. And it's just fucking beautiful. And so, like, the most beautiful parts of humans have to do with something that transcends what's in it for me. And death forces you to that. So not, not only does death create the urgency, it, uh, urgency of doing 
it, it, it you're very right it does have a sense in which it uh incentivizes the compersion mm -hmm. and the compassion mm -hmm. and the widening you remember einstein had that quote something to the effect of it's an optical delusion of consciousness to believe there are separate things there's this one thing we call universe and uh something about us being inside of a prison of perception that can only you know s see a very narrow little bit of it but this this might be just some weird disposition of mine but when i think about the future after i'm dead and i think about consciousness i think about young people falling in love for the first time and their, their experience and i think about people being awed by sunsets and i think about mm, all of it right i can't not feel connected to that do you feel some sadness to the very high likelihood that you will be forgotten completely by all of human history you daniel the name that that which cannot be named systems like to self-perpetuate egos do that the idea that I might do something meaningful that future people will appreciate, of course, there's like a certain sweetness to that idea. But I know how many people did something, did things that I wouldn't be here without, and that my life would be less without, whose names I will never know. And I feel a gratitude to them. I feel a closeness. I feel touched by that. And I think to the degree that the future people are conscious enough, there is a you know, a lot of traditions had this kind of, are we being good ancestors and respect for the ancestors beyond the names? Um, I think that's a very healthy idea. What do you think is the role of death in uh, in all of this? The, the fear of death. Does that interplay with consciousness? Does this self-reflection, do you think there's some deep connection between this ability to, to contemplate the fact that the our flame of of uh consciousness eventually goes out yeah i don't think unfortunately panpsychism helps particularly with life after death because you know for the panpsychist there's nothing supernatural there's nothing beyond the physical all there is really is ultimately particles and fields it's just that we think the ultimate nature of particles and fields is consciousness. But I guess when um, when the, uh, the, the matter in my brain ceases to be ordered in a way that sustains the particular kind of consciousness uh, I enjoy in waking life, then in some sense I, 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 I will cease to be. Although I do, the, the final chapter of my book, Galileo's Error, is more experimental. So the first four chapters are the cold-blooded case for the panpsychist view as the, the best solution to the hard problem of consciousness. Yeah, the last chapter is where you talk about meaning. Yeah, I talk about meaning, I talk about free will, and I talk about mystical experiences. So I always want to emphasize that panpsychism is not necessarily connected to anything spiritual. You know, a lot of people defending this view, like David Chalmers or Luke Roloff's, are just total atheist secularists, right? They don't believe in any kind of transcendent reality. They just believe in feelings, you know, mundane consciousness and think that needs explaining and our conventional scientific approach can't cut it. But if for independent reasons, you are motivated to some spiritual picture of reality, then maybe a panpsychist view is, is more consonant with that. So if you if you have a mystical experience where you, um, it seems to you in this experience that there is this higher form of consciousness at the root of all things. If you're a materialist, you've got to think that's a delusion. You know, there's just something in your brain making you think that it's not real. But if you're a panpsychist and you already think the fundamental nature of reality is constituted of consciousness, it's not that much of a leap to think that um, this higher form of consciousness you seem to apprehend in the mystical experience is part of that underlying reality. And, you know, in, in many different cultures, experienced meditators have claimed to have experiences 
in which it becomes apparent to them that there is an element of consciousness that is universal. So this is sometimes called universal consciousness. So on this view, your mind and my mind are not uh, totally distinct. Uh, each of our individual conscious minds is built upon the foundations of universal consciousness. And universal consciousness as it exists in me is one and the same thing as universal consciousness as it exists in you. So I've never had one of these experiences. Um, but if one is a panpsychist, I think one is more open to that possibility. I don't see why it shouldn't be the case that that is part of the nature of consciousness and maybe something that is apparent in certain deep states of meditation. And so what I explore in the experimental final chapter of my book is that could allow for a kind of impersonal life after death, because if that view is true, then even when the particular aspects of my conscious experience fall away, that element of universal consciousness at the core of my identity would continue to exist. So I'd sort of be, as it were, absorbed into universal consciousness. So, I mean, Buddhists and Hindu mystics uh, try to meditate to get rid of all the bad karma to be absorbed into universal consciousness. It could be that if uh, if there's no karma, if there's no reverb, maybe everyone gets enlightened when they die. Maybe you uh, just sink back into universal consciousness. So I, al I also, coming back to morality, suggest this could provide some kind of basis for altruism or non-egotism. Because if you think egotism implicitly assumes that we are utterly distinct individuals, whereas on, on, on this view, we do, we're not, we overlap to an extent that something at the core of our being is... Even in this life, we overlap. That would be this view that some experienced meditators claim becomes apparent to them that there is something at the core of my identity that is one and the same as the thing at the core of your identity, uh, this universal consciousness. Yeah, there is something very, like you and I in this conversation, there's a few people listening to this, all of us are in a, in a kind of single mind together. There's some small aspect of that, and or maybe a big aspect about us humans. So certainly in the space of ideas, we kind of um, meld together for time, at least in a conversation and kind of play with that idea. And then we're clearly all thinking, like if I say pink elephant, there's going to be a few people that are now visualizing a pink elephant. We're all thinking about that pink elephant together. We're all in the room together thinking about this pink elephant. And we're like rotating it, um, like, you know, in our minds together. What is that? That mm -hmm. pink elephant, is that, is there a different instantiation of that pink elephant in everybody's mind? Or is it the same elephant? And we have the same mind exploring that elephant. Now, if we in our mind start petting that elephant, like touching it, that experience that we're now like thinking what that would feel like, it, what's that? Is that all of us experiencing that together or is that separate? So like there's some aspect of, of the togetherness that almost seems fundamental to civilization, to society. Mm. So hopefully that's not too strong, but to like some of the fundamental properties of the human mind, it feels like the social aspect is really important. We call it social because we think of us as individual minds interacting. But if we're just like one collective mind with like fingertips, they're like, touching each other as it's trying to explore the elephant. But that could be just in the realm of ideas and intelligence yeah. and not in the realm of consciousness. And it's interesting to see maybe it is in the realm of consciousness. Yeah, so it's obviously certainly true in some sense that there are these phenomena that you're talking about of collective consciousness in some sense. I suppose the question is how ontologically serious do we want to be about those things? By which I mean, are they just a construction of out of our minds and the fact that we interact in the standard, standardly scientifically accepted ways? Or is, as someone like Rupert Sheldrake would think, that there is some metaphysical reality, there are some fields beyond the scientifically understood ones that are somehow communicating this. Um, 
I mean, I think that, that I mean, the view I was describing was that this element we're supposed to have in common is is some sort of pure impersonal consciousness or something rather mm -hmm. than. So actually, I mean, an interesting figure is the the Australian philosopher Miri Al-Bahari, who defends a kind of mystical conception of reality rooted in uh, Advaita Vedanta mysticism. But like me, she's from this tradition of analytic philosophy. And so she defends this in this, you know, incredibly precise, rigorous way. She defends the idea that we should think of experienced meditators as uh, providing expert testimony. So, you know, I think humans cause are causing climate breakdown. I have no idea of the science behind it, you know, I, but I trust the experts or, you know, that the universe is 14 billion years old. You know, most of our knowledge is based on expert testimony. And she thinks we should think of experienced meditators, these people who are telling us about this universal consciousness at the core of our being as a relevant kind of expert. And so she wants to defend, you know, the rational acceptability of this mystical conception of reality. So it's what, you know, I think we shouldn't be ashamed, you know, we shouldn't be worried about dealing with certain views as long as it's done with rigor and seriousness. You know, I think sometimes terms like, I don't know, new age or something can function a bit like racist terms. You know, a racist term picks out a group of people, but then implies certain negative characteristics. So people use this term, you know, to pick out a certain set of views like mystical conception of reality and, and imply it's kind of fluffy thinking or, but, you know, you read Miri Al-Bahari, you read Luke Roloff's, this is serious, rigorous thought, whether you agree with it or not, obviously it's hugely controversial. And so, you know, the enlightenment ideal is to follow the evidence and the arguments where they lead. But it's kind of very hard for human beings to do that. I think we get stuck in some conception of how we think science ought to look. Mm -hmm. um, and, and um, you know, people talk about religion as a crutch, but I think a certain kind of scientism a certain conception of how science is supposed to be gets into people's identity and their sense of themselves and their security um, and makes things hard if you're a panpsychic. So th there's another burden that comes with this whole intelligence thing that humans got is um, the extinguishing of the light of consciousness, which is uh, kind of realizing that we're gonna be dead someday. And uh, there's a bunch of philosophers like Ernest Becker, who kind of think that this realization of mortality and then fear, sometimes they call it terror of, of, of mortality is one of the creative forces behind human condition. Like it's the thing that drives us. Do you think it's important for an AI system? You know, when Psych <laughs> proposed that it's one, it's not human and it's one of the, moderators of his contents. Um, you know, there's another question it could ask, which is like, it kind of knows that humans are mortal. Am I mortal? And I think one really important uh, thing that's possible when you're conscious is to fear the extinguishing of that consciousness, the fear of mortality. Do you think that's useful for intelligence? Thinking like I, I might die and I really don't want to die. I, I don't think so. I think it may help um, some humans to be um, better people. It may help some humans to be more creative and so on. I don't think it's necessary um, for AIs to believe that they have limited lifespans and therefore they should make the most of their behavior. Maybe eventually um, the answer to that and my answer to that will change. But as of now, I would say that that's almost like a a frill or a side effect uh, that um, is not. And in fact, if you look at most humans, most humans um, ignore the fact that they're going to die most of the time. Uh, so, uh, well, but that's like uh, this goes to the white space between the words. So, what Ernest Becker argues is that that ignoring is we're living in an illusion that we constructed on the foundation of this terror. So, we're escape life as we know it pursuing things, creating things, love, everything we can think of that's beautiful about humanity is is just trying to escape this realization that we're going to die one day. That's his, that's his idea. And I think, I don't know if I 100% I 
believe in this, but there's, it certainly rhymes. It seems like to me, like it rhymes with the truth. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that for some people, um, that's gonna be a more powerful factor than others. Clearly Doug is talking about Russians. <laughs> and I think that... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> so I'm Russian, so it clearly yeah. it uh, infiltrates all of Russian literature. And, and AI doesn't have to have uh, fear of death as a motivating force in that we can build in motivation. So we can build in the motivation of obeying users and making users happy and making others happy and and so on. And that can substitute for this sort of personal fear of death that sometimes leads to uh, bursts of creativity in, in humans. Yeah, I don't know. I think like, I think AI really needs to understand death deeply in order to be able to drive a car, for example. I, I think there's just some like, there, no, I, I really disagree. <laughs> I think it needs to understand the value of human life, especially the value of human life to other humans, the um, and understand that certain things are more important than other things. So it has to have a lot of knowledge about ethics and uh, morality and so on. But some of it is so messy that it's impossible to encode. For example, I, there's, I, if, I if disagree. There's a, so if there's a person dying right in front of us, most human beings would help that person, but they would not apply that same ethics to everybody else in the world. I mean, this is the tragedy of how difficult it is to be a doctor because they know when they help a dying child, they know that the money they're spending on this child cannot possibly be spent on every other child that's dying. And that's, that's a very difficult to encode decision. <laughs> now, uh, perhaps, Perhaps it is, perhaps it could be formalized. Oh, but I mean, you're, you're talking about autonomous vehicles, right? So autonomous vehicles are going to have to make those decisions um, all the time of um, what is the chance of this bad event happening? Um, how bad is that compared to this chance of that bad event happening and so on? And, you know, when an, a potential accident is about to happen, is it worth taking this risk if I have to make a choice? Which of these two cars am I going to hit and why? And See, I was thinking about a very different choice when I'm talking about fear of mortality, which is just observing uh, Manhattan style driving. I think that <laughs> humans as an effective driver needs to threaten pedestrians' lives a lot. There's a dance, I've, I've watched pedestrians a lot, I've, I've worked on this problem and it seems like the the if I could summarize the problem of a pedestrian crossing is the car with this movement is saying, I'm going to kill you. And the pedestrian is saying, maybe. And then they decide and they say, no, I don't think you, you have the guts to kill me. And you walk and they walk in front and they look away. And there's that dance, the, 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 the pedestrian, is this a social contract that the pedestrian trusts that once they're in front of the car and the car is sufficiently from a physics perspective, able to stop, they're going to stop. But the car also has to threaten that pedestrian. It's like, I'm late for work, so you're being kind of an asshole by crossing in front of me. But life and death is in like is part of the calculation here. And it's that that equation is being solved millions of times a day. Like, yes. Very effectively. That game theory, whatever, yes. whatever that formulation uh, absolutely. is. Absolutely. I just I don't know if it's as simple as like, some formalizable game theory problem. It, it could very well be in the case of driving and in the case of most of uh, human society. I, I don't know, but it, uh, yeah, you, you might be right that this sort of uh, the fear of death is just one of the quirks of uh, like the way our brains have evolved, but it's not, it's not a necessary feature of, uh, of, of intelligence. Drivers certainly are always doing this kind of estimate, even if it's unconscious, subconscious of what are the chances of various bad outcomes happening? Like for instance, um, if I don't wait for this pedestrian or something like that. Yeah. And um, what is the downside to me going to be in terms of um, you know, time wasted talking to the police or um, you know, getting sent to jail or you know, things like that. And so- um, And there's also emotion, like people in their cars tend to get uh, irrationally angry. Well, that's, that's, that's dangerous, but 
you know, think think about this is all part of why I think that autonomous vehicles, um, truly autonomous vehicles, are farther out than um, than most people do because um, there is this enormous level of complexity which goes beyond uh, mechanically controlling the car, um, and um, I I can see the autonomous vehicles as a kind of metaphorical and literal accident waiting to happen, <laughs> um, and not just because of their um, overall um, um, incurring versus preventing accidents and so on, but just because of the um, almost um, voracious appetite people have for um, um, bad bad stories about powerful companies and powerful entities. When when I was um, at a coincidentally Japanese fifth generation computing system conference in 1987. Uh, while I happened to be there, um, there was a worker at an auto plant who was despondent and committed suicide by climbing under the safety chains and so on and getting stamped to death by a machine. And instead of being a small story that said, despondent worker commits suicide, it was front page news that effectively said, robot kills worker, because the public is just waiting for stories about like, AI kills phonogenic family of five right. type stories. And even if you could show that nationwide, uh, this system saved more lives than it cost and saved more injuries, um, prevented more injuries than it caused and so on, um, the media, the public, the government is just coiled and ready to pounce on stories where in fact it failed, even if they are relatively few. Yeah, it's so fascinating to watch us humans resisting the cutting edge of science and technology and almost like hoping for it to fail and constantly, and, you know, this just happens over and over and over throughout history. Well, or even if we're not hoping for it to fail, we're, we're fascinated by it. And yeah. in terms of what we find interesting, um, the one in a thousand failures, much more interesting than the 999 um, boring successes. Are you yourself afraid of death? No. Do you think about it? Does it make sense to you that this thing ends? Like do you, uh, the Stoics contemplated death. It gives flavor to life. It makes you appreciate. There's something about finiteness of life that makes it, that makes it this uh, Jocko Discipline Go drink sour apple that I'm enjoying is delicious, makes it taste better because I'm going to die one day. And I think about that a lot. Do you think about it? Other than I know that it's gonna end, I mean, but I don't think about it on a daily basis. I think about- It's just a fact. I think about, I know that I'm lucky to be here. I know that many people sacrificed to give me this opportunity to be here. So, but I don't dwell on it. What about when you were in combat? Nothing. There's, there's tactics, there's strategy, there's the mission. And then your mortality is not part of the calculation. I think you get to a point where you accept the fact that you can die. Like I, I, you know, like I said, you can do everything right. You roll out the gate, you hit an IED a triple stack subsurface IED and you're dead, you're done. And there's nothing that's going to stop that. It's going to happen. And I think if you're scared of that or you're thinking about that, it's going to inhibit your ability to do your job properly. And I think it's also going to drive you crazy. The thing that I thought about more was that happening to my guys. And that's the gut wrenching terror that you feel when, when operations happen. Can I ask you about love of country? Is it, it's um, uh, it continues to just how much I've studied Stalin recently in the past few years. It continues to surprise me, not surprise me. It's it's just tragic in some kind of way. I'm not sure exactly if I could put words to it, but how many people and still do, but at the time were willing, loved Stalin, and were willing to die for country, for the love of country. 
And I too, maybe because I was born there, and now I am a red-blooded American, uh, I love, nationalism is a bad word, but I love the love of country. It gives, it somehow gives a meaning, like a brotherhood, like we're in this together. I, I love, that's why I love the Olympics. That's just the, the unity of it. It uh, takes a step out of the selfish pursuits of any one particular ant and looks at us as a big ant colony. And it's inspiring, it's, uh, it's exciting. But at the same time, it seems to get us to do horrible things if, um, if uh, manipulated by charismatic leaders. What do you make of this love of country? Is it a, is it a bad thing? Is it a thing that gets in the way? Or is it a good thing? Well, I think like anything else, if it's balanced correctly, it's great. And if it goes to some extreme level, then it becomes a negative. And I think it, I think it's probably sourced in some sort of animalistic tribalism that we all have to be part of a tribe. And this is a real big tribe that you get to be a part of. And all you have to do is kind of show up. And so when someone says, hey, we're going to play hockey against the Russians. Well, we're going to cheer for the American boys. So when you look up to the stars, do you think about that quickly approaching end of yours? Do you think about your own mortality? Do you think about your death? Are you afraid of your death? I'm a huge fan of stoicism, right? I read a lot, lot of stoicism. Um, I think Ryan Holiday's done a great job of bringing some of that back into the forefront. It's just uh, really thought provoking to me and, and rings, a lot of it rings, just hits me and says, I think that's right. And that moment, memento mori thing, which is, hey, we're all going to die, so you should contemplate it. There's a finality to this thing. And so I think if you can rightly frame that between fretting about it every day and being afraid and being so laissez-faire that you think, you know, you're going you're gonna to live forever, it'll influence some of the decisions you make. It will influence the way you attack things um, and hopefully the, the way that you live your life. So yes, I, I, I wouldn't say I obsess over it and I wouldn't say it's omnipresent, um, but because I read a lot of stoicism and just I think it's, it's right to pause and say, who knows, right? There's going to be an expiration date. And if it happened tomorrow, am I, have I done the things I wanted to do? And am I the person I wanted to, to be? And I, I think it's important along the way to check those things. Yeah, I try to make sure that, that I actually visualize this, that I'm okay dying at the end of the day, at the, at the end of each day. Like, if this is the last thing I do in my life is talking to you. Oh, good Lord. I'm... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy. You're, you're, I know you're joking, but I'm. I, I you know that. Um, yeah, I'm. I'm happy. I get to live the life I do, and I think memento more. I think the the Stoics have it right. So you and and you have it right in saying, meditate on death enough to remember that this ride ends pretty quickly yeah. to help you appreciate uh, every day and the people you love, the people close to you and the cool shit that you're doing in your life, the cool shit you're creating, and the fact that you, Mr. Thomas Tall, are playing with the motherfucking Rolling Stones tomorrow. <laughs> you are the yeah. man in so many disciplines, so so respected, so successful. It's truly an honor that you sit down and talk with me today. Thomas, thank you so much for showing up in Texas and for talking on this silly little podcast. Oh, it's great, man. I'm a huge fan of the show and have had a great time hanging with you and uh, really appreciate it. Thanks for listening to this conversation with Thomas Tall. To support this podcast, please check out our sponsors in the description. And now, let me leave you with some words from Mick Jagger and the Rolling Stones. You can't always get what you want, but if you try sometimes, you might find you'll get what you need. Thank you for listening, and hope to see you next time.
Mm. You know, I, I feel that sense of terror every time Kerouac, Jack Kerouac talked about this in, on the road, is, you know, when you leave a place, if you're honest about it, like life is short. And when you leave a place, you move to a new place and you think of all the friends, maybe family you're leaving behind as you drive over the hill, that that really is goodbye. Like we sometimes don't think of it that way when we're moving, but that really is goodbye mm -hmm. to that life, to the person you were, to the, all the people. Maybe if it's close friends, you'll see them maybe 10, 15 more times in your life and that's yeah. it. Yeah. And you're saying goodbye to all of that. And so in the same way, I, I see this way more dramatic when you're flying away from Earth, and it's like it's goodbye to Dunkin' Donuts and Starbucks, <laughs> and it's it's goodbye to whatever. I, I don't know why I picked those, but mm. some all the things that yeah. are special to Earth, it's goodbye. But that's that's life. I, I suppose more what excites me about that kind of journey is it's a distinct contemplation of your mortality, acceptance of your mortality. You, you're saying. Just like when you take on any difficult journey, it's accepting that you're going to die one day and might as well do something truly exciting. Yeah, so. I mean, I will, you know, I'm with you on that. I, uh, I'm a strong believer that deep underneath human motivation is this, this terror of our own mortality. You know, there's this uh, wonderful book that had a great influence on me called The Denial of Death by Ernest Becker. And when you are aware of the ways in which our mortality influences our behaviors, it really does add a different slant, a different kind of color to the interpretation of human behavior. Yeah, it, it's funny, um, that, that book had a big influence on me as well. Oh, is that right? Wow. Um, and uh, terror management theory and, and yeah. I, again, from an engineering perspective, I don't know how many people that book influenced because I, I talk to people about the fear of death and it doesn't seem to be that fundamental to their experience. And I don't think on the surface it's fundamental to my experience, but it seems like an awfully, in terms of we talk about models and string theory and theories, in terms of theories of this macro experience of human life, it seems like a heck of a good theory that the fear of death is at the kind of, is the warm at the core. Yeah. Well, I mean, and the terror management theories that you make reference to, I mean, the this is a group of, you know, psychologists, social psychologists who devised these very clever experiments, real world experiments with real people, where you can directly measure the hidden influence of the recognition of our own mortality. I mean, they've done these experiments where they have group of people, A, group of people, B, and the only difference between the two groups is that group B, they somehow reminded them in some subtle way of their own mortality. Sometimes it's nothing more than interviewing them mm -hmm. with a funeral home across the street. Mm -hmm. You know, an influence is there, but it's, but it's subtle. You don't even think you take note of. And they can find measurable effects that differentiate the two groups to a high degree of statistical significance and how they respond to certain challenges or certain kinds of questions that shows a direct influence of the reminder of their own mortality. And I've read a number of these studies and they are really convincing. And so, yeah, I would say that the reason why so many people would say that, yeah, fear of mortality is not front and center in my worldview. Yeah, I don't really think about it much. It doesn't really matter too much. The reason why they're able to say that is because this thing called culture has emerged over the course of the last 10,000 years. Yeah. And part of the role of culture is to give us a means of not thinking about yeah. our mortality all the time, of not living in terror of the inevitable end which faces us all. So it's completely understandable that that's the response because that's what culture is at least in part for. It's at least possible that uh, the fear of death, the terror of your mortality is the creative force that created all of the things around us at this human civilization. Yeah, well, and, and I yeah. think about from an engineering perspective, uh, this is where I lose all of my robotics uh, colleagues, is I feel like if you want to create intelligence, you have to also engineer in some kind of echoes of this kind of fear of, uh, and not, you know, fear is such a complicated word, but kind of a, like a scarcity 
uh, a scarcity of time, a scarcity of resources that creates a kind of anxiety, like deadlines get you to do stuff. Yeah. And there's something almost fundamental to that in terms of uh, human experience. Yeah, well, that's an interesting thought. So you're basically, in order to create a kind of structure that mirrors what we call consciousness, yes. you better have that structure confront the same kinds of yes. issues and terrors so, that, suff- that, that we do. Consciousness and suffering only make sense in the context of death. If you want to, f- I feel like, if you want to fit into human society, if, you, if you're a robot and if you want to fit into human society, you better have the same kind of existential dread the same kind of fear of mortality. Right. Otherwise, you're not going to fit in. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, it might be That's it good. might be wild, but it's at least like we're talking about all the theories that are at least worth consideration. I think that's a really powerful one, and definitely one has uh, resonated with me, mm. and um, definitely seems to capture something beautifully like real about the human condition. And I I wonder, it's of course sucks to think that we need death to appreciate life. Um, But uh, that just may be the way it is. Well, it's interesting if this robotic or artificially intelligent system understands the world and understands the second law of thermodynamics and entropy, even an artificial intelligence will realize that even if its parts are really robust, ultimately it will disintegrate. Yeah. I mean, so the time scales may be different, but in a way, when you think about it, it doesn't matter. Once you know that you are mortal in the sense that you are not eternal, the time scale hardly matters mm-hmm. because it's it's either the whole thing or not. Because on the scales of eternity, any finite duration, however large, is effectively zero mm-hmm. on the scales of eternity. And so maybe it won't be so hard for an artificial system to feel that sense of mortality because it will recognize the underlying physical laws and recognize its own finitude. And then it'll be us and robots drinking beers, looking up at the stars and just, uh, you know, (laughs) uh, having a good laugh in awe of the whole thing. Yeah. I think that's a pretty good way to end it, talking about the fear of death. We started talking about the meaning of life and ended on the fear of death. Brian, it's just an incredible conversation. <laughs> My pleasure. Thank you. I enjoyed I it enormously. I really, really enjoyed it. It's been a long time coming. I'm a huge fan of your work, a huge fan of your writing. Thanks Thank for you. talking today, Brian. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this conversation with Brian Green. To support this podcast, please check out our sponsors in the description. And now, let me leave you with some words from Bill Bryson. Physics is really nothing more than a search for ultimate simplicity. But so far, all we have is a kind of elegant messiness. Thank you for listening and hope to see you next time. What is the role of death and fear of death in life? Well, from our perspective, the uniquely human awareness of death and our unwillingness to accept that fact, we would argue is the primary motivational impetus for almost everything that people do, whether they're aware of it or not. So that's kind of been your life work, your view of the human condition is that death, you've written the book, Warm at the Core, that death is at the core of our consciousness of everything, of how we see the world, of what drives us. Maybe can you, can you elaborate like what, how you see death fitting in? What does it mean to be at the core of our being? So I think that's a a great question. And, you know, to be pedantic, I usually start, you know, my psychology classes uh, and I say to the students, okay, uh, you know, let's define our terms and the ology part they get right away. You know, it's the study of, and then we get to the psyche part and, and understandably, you know, the students are like, oh, that means mind. And I'm like, well, no, that's a modern 
interpretation, uh, but in a, in a ancient Greek, it means soul, uh, but not in the Cartesian dualistic sense that most of us in the West think when that word comes to mind. And so you hear the word soul, and you're like, well, all right, that's the non-physical part of me that's potentially detachable from my corporal container when I'm no longer here. Uh, but uh, Aristotle's, who coined the word psyche, I think, um, he was uh, not a dualist. He was a monist. He thought that the soul was inextricably connected to the body, and he defined soul as the essence of a natural body that is alive. And then he goes on and he says, all right, uh, let me give you an example. If, um, if an ax was alive, the soul of an ax would be to chop. And if you can pluck your eyeball out of your head and it was still functioning, then the soul of the eyeball would be to see. You know, and then he's like, all right, the soul of a grasshopper is to hop. The soul of a woodpecker is to peck, which raises the question, of course, what is the essence of what it means to be human? And here, of course, there is no one universally accepted conception of the essence of our humanity. All right, Aristotle, uh, you know, gives us the idea of humans as rational animals. You know, we're homo sapiens, but not the only game in town. You got Joseph Heusinger, an anthropologist in the 20th century. He called us homo ludens, that we're basically fundamentally playful creatures. And then I think it was Hannah Arendt uh, homo faber, we're tool-making creatures. Uh, another woman, Ellen Dizanayake, wrote a book called Homo Aestheticus. Uh, and following Aristotle and his poetics, she's like, well, we're not only rational animals, we're also aesthetic creatures that appreciate beauty. Uh, there's another take on humans, I think they call us Homo Narratans. Uh, we're all, we're storytelling creatures. And I, I think all of those uh, designations of what it means to be human are quite useful heuristically and certainly worthy of our collective cogitation. But what, what garnered my attention when I was a young punk was just a single line in an essay by a Scottish guy who was Alexander Smith uh, in, in a book called Dreamthorpe. I think it's written in the 1860s. He just says right in the middle of an essay, it is our knowledge that we have to die that makes us human. And I remember reading that and I, in my gut, I was like, oh man, I don't like that, but I think you're onto something. <laughs> and then William James, the, the great Harvard philosopher and arguably the first academic psychologist, he referred to death as the worm at the core of the human condition. So that's where the worm at the core idea comes in. And, and that's just an allusion to um, the story of Genesis back in the proverbial old days in the Garden of Eden, uh, everything was going tremendously well and, until the serpent tempts Eve to take a chomp out of the apple of the tree of knowledge, and Adam partakes also. And, and this is, according to the Bible, what brings death into the world. And, and from our vantage point, uh, the story of Genesis is a remarkable allegorical uh, recount uh, of the origin of consciousness, where we get to the point uh, where, by virtue of our vast intelligence, we come to realize the inevitability uh, of death. And so, uh, you know, the apple is beautiful and it's tasty. Uh, but when you get right into the middle of it, there's that ugly reality, which is our finitude. And then fast forward a bit, and uh, I was a, a young professor at Skidmore College in 1980. Um, my PhD is in experimental social psychology, and I, I mainly did studies um, with clinical psychologists evaluating the efficacy of non-pharmacological interventions to reduce stress. Uh, and that was good work, and I found it interesting, but uh, 
in my first week as a professor at Skidmore, uh, I just walking up and down the shelves of the library, uh, saw some books by a guy I had never heard of, Ernest Becker, uh, a cultural anthropologist, recently deceased. He died in 1974. Um, uh, after um, weeks before, actually, he was posthumously uh, awarded the Pulitzer Prize in nonfiction for his book, The Denial of Death. Uh, and, and that was his last book? It, well, it's actually his next to last book. I don't know how you pull this off, but he had one more after he died called Escape from Evil. And evidently it was supposed to, originally the denial of death was supposed to be this giant thousand page book that was both. And they split it up and the what became Escape from Evil, uh, his wife Marie Becker finished. Well, be that as it may, in it is in the denial of death uh, where Becker just says it in the first paragraph, I, I, I believe, uh, that the terror of death and the way that human beings respond to it or decline to respond to it is primarily responsible for almost everything we do, whether we're aware of it or not, and mostly we're not. And so I, I read that first paragraph, Lex, and I was like, wow, okay, this dude- You're onto something. You're onto something. It's the same thing It's here. the same thing. And then it reminded me, I think, um, not to play psychologist, but, you know, let's face it, I believe there's a reason why we end up drifting where we ultimately come to. So I'm in my mid-20s. I got Ernest Becker's book in my hand, and the next thing I know, I'm remembering uh, when I'm eight years old, the day that my grandmother died. Uh, and, you know, the day before, my mom um, said, oh, say goodbye to Grandma. She's not well. And, okay, so I was like, okay, Grandma. And I knew she wasn't well, but I didn't really appreciate the magnitude of her illness. Well, she dies the next day. and. It's in the evening, and I'm just sitting there looking at my stamp collection, and I'm like, wow, I'm going to miss my grandmother. And then I'm like, no, wait a minute. That means my mother's going to die and uh, after she gets old. And that's even worse. After all, who's going to make me dinner? And that bothered me for a while, but then I'm looking at the stamps, all the dead American presidents. Uh -huh. And I'm like, there's George Washington. He's dead. There's Thomas Jefferson. He's dead. My mom's going to be dead. Oh, I'm going to get old and be dead someday. And at eight years old, that was my first explicit existential crisis. I remember it being, you know, one of these blood curdling realizations that I tried my best uh, to ignore f for the most of the time I was subsequently growing up. But fast forward back to Skidmore College, mid 20s, you know, reading Becker's book in the 1980s, thinking to myself, wow, one of the reasons why I'm finding this so compelling is that it squares with my own personal experience. And then to make a short story long, and I'll, I'll shut up, Lex, but what, <laughs> what grabbed me about Becker, and this is in part uh, because I read a lot of his other books, um, there's another book, The Birth and Death of Meaning, uh, which is framed um, in, from an evolutionary perspective. And, and then The Denial of Death is really more framed from an existential psychodynamic vantage point. And, and as a, a young um, academic, uh, I was really taken by what I found to be a, a very potent juxtaposition that you really don't see that often. Yet usually evolutionary types are eager to dismiss the psychodynamic types and vice versa, and maybe only John Bowlby, uh, you know, there's part, there's other folks, but uh, the attachment theorist, uh, John Bowlby, uh, was really one of the first serious academics to say these, um, these ways of thinking about things 
are, are quite compatible. And can you comment on what's what a psychodynamics view of the world is versus an evolutionary view of the world, just in case people are not? Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's that's a fine question. Well, for the evolutionary types um, in general, are interested in um, how it is and why it is that uh, we uh, have adapted to our surroundings in the service of persisting over time and, and being represented in the gene pool thereafter. You used to be a fish. Yes. We used to be a fish and I'll, <laughs> yeah, and I would end up uh, talking on a podcast. So yeah. How we came to be that way. How we came to be that way. And so, whereas the existential psychodynamic types, I would say, are more interested in development across a single lifespan. And, but, but the evolutionary types dismiss the psychodynamic types as overly speculative and devoid of empirical support for their views. Uh, they, um, you know, it, it, they'll just say, these guys are talking shit, if you'll pardon the expression. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, uh, you can turn right around and say the same about the evolutionary types. They, they are often and rightfully criticized, evolutionary psychologists, uh, for what are called the just so stories, uh, where it's like, oh, this is probably why fill in the blank is potentially adaptive. And, and my thought, uh, again, early on uh, was I didn't see any um, intrinsic antithesis between these viewpoints. I just found them dialectically compatible and uh, uh, very powerful when combined. So one question I would ask here is uh, about a science being speculative. You know, we understand so little about the human mind. You said you picked up Becker's book and, you know, it felt like he was onto something. That's the same thing I felt when I picked up Becker's book, uh, probably also in my early 20s. Uh, you know, I read a lot of philosophy, but it felt like the question of the meaning of life kind of, uh, you know, this seemed to be the most, uh, the closest to the truth somehow. It was onto something. So I, I guess the question I, I want to ask also is like, um, how speculative is psychology? How, like all of your life's work, <laughs> um, how do you feel, how confident do you feel about the whole thing, about understanding our mind? I feel confidently unconfident to have it bo both ways. Like what do we make of psychology? What do we make starting with Freud, you know, starting, um, just, just our, or even just philosophy, uh, even uh, the aspects of uh, the, the sciences, like uh, you know, my, my field of artificial intelligence, but also physics. You know, it it often feels like, man, we don't really understand most of what's going on here, and certainly that's true with uh, the human mind. Yeah, well, to me, that's the proper epistemological stance. <laughs> I don't uh, know anything. <laughs> uh, well. Uh, it's the Socratic, uh, I know that I don't know, yeah. which is the first step on the path to wisdom. I, I would argue forcefully that we know a lot more than we used to. Mm -hmm. I would argue equally forcefully, uh, not that I have a PhD in the philosophy of science, but I, I believe that the Thomas Kuhns of the world are right when they point out that change is not necessarily progress. And so on the one hand, I, I do think we know a lot more than we did back in the day when if you wanted to fly, you put on some wax wings and jumped <laughs> off a mountain. Yeah. On the other hand, I think it's quite arrogant when scientists, I'll just speak about psychological scientists, um, when they have the audacity to mistake statistical precision uh, for knowledge and insight, and when they make the mistake, in my estimation, um, that Einstein bemoaned, uh, and that's this idea that the mere accumulation of data uh, will necessarily result in conceptual breakthroughs. 
And so I, I like the, um, well, we're all, I hope, appreciative of the people who trained us. But I remember my first day in graduate school at the University of Kansas, uh, they brought us into a room and on one side of the board was a quote by Kurt Lewin or Levine, famous German uh, social psychologist. And it was nothing, and the quote is, there's nothing more useful than a good theory. And then on the other side was another quote by a German physicist. His name eludes me. And it was all theories are wrong. And I'm like, uh, which is it? And of course, the point is that it's both. Our, our theories are, I believe, powerful ways to direct our attention uh, to aspects of human affairs that uh, might render us um, better able to understand ourselves and the world around us. Now, I also, uh, as an experimental psychologist, uh, I adhere to the view uh, that theories are essentially hypothesis-generating devices, uh, and that at its best, science is a dialectical interplay where you have theoretical assertions that yield testable hypotheses and that uh, either results in the corroboration of the theory, the rejection of it, or the modification thereafter. Whenever I bring up Ernest Becker's work, which I do, and, and yours quite a bit, I find it surprising how that it's not a lot more popular in a sense that, uh, no, we're not, well, I don't mean just your book. Yeah. Uh, that's well written, people should read it, should buy it, whatever. Uh, uh, I think it has the same kind of qualities that are useful to think about is like Jordan Peterson's work and stuff sure. like that. But I, I just mean like why people uh, are not, don't think of that as a compelling description of um, the core of the human yeah. condition. Like I think what you mentioned about Heidegger is quite connects with me quite well. So I ask uh, on this podcast, I often ask people if they're afraid of death. That's like almost every single part. I almost always get criticized for asking world class people, uh, scientists and te technologists, and about the fear of death and the meaning of life. And on the fear of death, they often like don't say anything interesting. What I mean by that is they haven't thought deeply about it. Like what yeah. you, you kind of brought this up a few times of really letting it sink in. Yeah. They kind of say this thing about what exactly what you said, which is like, uh, it's something that happens not today. Like I'm aware that it's something that happens yeah. and I'm not, the, the thing they usually say is I'm not afraid of death. I just want to live a good life kind of thing. Yeah. And it, uh, what, what I, I'm trying to express is like when I look in their eyes and the kind of the, the core of the conversation, it looks like they haven't really become, like they haven't really meditated on death. I guess the question is, um, what do I say to people uh, that there's something to really think about here? Like there's some demons some realities that need to be faced yeah. by more people. Well, that's a tough one. Uh, you know, I could tell you what not to do. Uh, <laughs> you know, so when we are young and annoying, yeah. um, a lot of famous people, mostly psychologists, because that's who we intersected with, that, you know, we would lay out these ideas and they would be, well, I, I don't think about death like that. So these ideas must be wrong. Yeah. And we would say, well, you don't think about death because you're lucky enough to be comfortably ensconced in a cultural worldview from which you derive self-esteem. And that has it's spared you the existential excruciations that would otherwise arise. But that's like Freud. You know, you're repressing. So you either agree with me, in which case I'm right, or you disagree with me. In which case you're repressing, and yeah. I'm right. Well, so that that's the uh, the the Nietzsche thing. I, I what I felt when I've there've been moments in my life, moments in my life when I really thought about death. I mean, there's not too many. Like really, really thought about it, and feel the thing when you felt at eight. Maybe I'm dramatizing or romanticizing it, but uh, 
I feel like it's uh, uh, the conservatives call it popularly like, or the, the movie Matrix call it the red pill yeah. moment. Uh, I feel like it's a dangerous thought because um, I feel like I'm taking a step out of a society. Like there's a nice narrative that we've all constructed. You are. And I'm yes. taking a step out and uh, it feels, it's, there's this feeling like you're basically droughting. I mean, it's, it's not a good feeling. It is not. But this gets back to the Heidegger Kierkegaard school of anxiety. You are stepping out. Yeah. And you are momentarily shrugging off the, the again, the culturally constructed psychological accoutrements that allow you to stand up in the morning. And but so I, I mean it that in that sense, it feels like I mean, um uh, what do you? Uh, how do you have that conversation? Because I guess I, I, I'm, I'm dancing around a, a, a set of questions, which is like I guess I'm disappointed that people don't are not uh, as willing to step outside, like uh, even just uh, even any kind of thought experiment. Yeah. Let's, let's forget uh, denial of death. Like um, uh, there's there's now a community of people. Let's take an easy one that I think is scientifically ridiculous, which is there's a community of people that believe that uh, the Earth is flat. Yeah. Uh, or actually, even even better, <laughs> that space is fake. <laughs> yeah. Uh, like, what I find surprising is that a lot of people I talk to are not willing to uh, be, like, imagine if it is, like, imagine the Earth is flat. Like, think about it. Right. Like, a lot of people just, like, no, the Earth is round. <laughs> they they're like uh, like scientists yeah. too. They're like, yeah. It's, uh, well, actually, wait. Have you actually like thought about it? Like, imagine like yes, as a yes. thought experiment that that like basically step outside the little narrative that we are comfortable with. Now that one in particular is <laughs> has really strong uh, uh, evidence uh, and scientific validation. So on, it's a pretty simple thing to show that it at least is not flat. Uh, but just the willingness to take a step outside of the stories that bring us comfort has uh, been disappointing that people are not willing to do that. Yeah. And I think uh, the philosophy that you've constructed and that Ernest Beck has constructed and you've tested, uh, I think is really compelling. And the fact that people aren't often willing to take that step yeah. is disappointing. Well, yes. But perhaps understandable. I mean, one of the, this is an anecdote, of course, but when we were trying to get a publisher for our book, um, I had a, we had a meeting with um, a publisher who uh, published some Malcolm Gladwell books. Yeah, and um, she said, "I'm very interested in your book, but can you write it without mentioning death? Because people don't like death." And we're like, no, it's really kind of central. Um, and I think that's part of it. I, I think, again, if these ideas have merit, and I actually like the way that you put it, Lex, it's that to step away is to momentarily expose yourself to all of the anxiety yeah, I, that our identity and our beliefs typically enable us to manage. I think it's as simple as that. Yeah, I, I, I had this experience um, in college with my best friend uh, who got really high. Uh, uh, <laughs> and he forgot it was uh, in the winter. It was really freezing. It was memorable to me. I think it's an analogy. It's very useful. Uh, so he went to get some pizza. <laughs> And of course, <laughs> of course. <laughs> and uh, he so I and he left me outside and said, I'll be back in five minutes. <laughs> and he forgot that he left me outside. And I remember it was uh, I was in like shorts. Yeah, it was freezing winter. Wow. And I remember standing outside it's a dorm and I'm looking from the outside in. It's a, a light and it's warm. And I'm just standing there frozen, I think for an hour or more. And I, that's how I think about it. Like, I just, I don't give a damn about the stupid winter or anything. I just want to, like, it's like a, 
I'm drawn to be back to the warm. Yes. To the, and that's how I feel about thinking about like death. It's like, yeah. at a certain point, it's like, it's too much. It's like that cold. I like I that. I want to be back into the be warm. Back. You know, I, getting back to Heidegger for a moment, I, I like the, yeah, he uses a lot the idea of feeling at home. Uh, uh, not as like in your house, but just feeling like you're comfortably situated. World. Correct. How has your relationship with death changed? This is a Russian program, I have to okay. ask you. So you've considered suicide throughout your life. You have been in the line of fire. You have witnessed death. You as a human being, a mortal one, do you think about your death these days? now that you have begun the journey with dealing with your trauma, do you think about your death? Are you afraid of your death? Well, you don't die, so that's why. What do you mean you don't die? You move on. Where do you go? To another plane and another vibration and another whatever you want to call it. This isn't it. This isn't all of it. This is a blip. This is a moment. This is a... I used to be afraid of death before the military. I was always afraid of dying. I don't know why. I had this irrational fear that I was going to be kidnapped in my room. Like seriously, like irrational fear, like afraid. Mm -hmm. um, and it's funny because I talked to Michaela mm -hmm. um, yesterday mm -hmm. and she said the same thing. And I was like, oh my God, I know what you're talking being about. Being afraid of being kidnapped? Yeah, she had this like fear that someone was going to come in and take her out of her room. I had the same fear. By a human being or I think a monster so. of some kind? No, I think like by a human being. And I had this oh. irrational fear that I was, that like something was going to happen to me. And like I said, I don't know if it's because like my parents were always made me aware of my surroundings. Like people take people. This is mm -hmm. a real thing that happens. Yeah. And I was really small. So, and I looked like a little boy. My hair was like that mm -hmm. when I was training. I had short, no hair. I had flat as a board. You would have thought I was a 12 year old boy. Mm -hmm. And so my mom's like, people take people, sweetie. That's just the reality of life you need to be aware. So I don't know if I had this ingrained in my mind. I was always like training to protect myself or fight someone off. So I was like afraid of like this irrational thing. And then I went overseas and then I realized that I could just be literally there talking to you, having a conversation and I could just be taken off the face of the earth. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing I can do about it. And then I adapted this idea that when it's my time, it'll be my time. But the difference is now, at least I know that if I do go and I do cross and I am and I do move on, I know that I live my life the way that I, I always hoped I would be proud to live. Can I ask you a dark question? Yeah. Because we, you mentioned Robin Williams, you mentioned Anthony Bourdain and your own struggle with suicide. Why do you think they ultimately lost the bat that battle. Why do you think they took their oh, lives? Man, that's a that's a loaded question because you could look at everything from, from biomarkers in the brain to know if their serotonin and dopamine levels were crashed in the ground. Like you, you, there's, there's biological reasonings for some people where they're born bipolar and they have, or, you know, they're schizophrenic. Like there's so many things we don't fully grasp about the brain but what we do know from my perspective, for me at least, there really is no rhyme or reason why I survived and others didn't. Stuff and things don't make you happy. People don't always know why they're feeling the way they're feeling, but they also are, also are not always willing to talk about it or be they put on a good front. And if nobody knows any different, what do you expect? And it's especially clear with the, the two of them that on the surface, they're you know exceptionally successful in so many dimensions. And, right. and still that means nothing. Material possessions, anything really is not, uh, doesn't guarantee you happiness. No, it doesn't. Well, that's scary. That's terrifying. But uh, when it's good, that's what makes it joyful. Like that's what right. happiness is. Is like, holy shit, somehow amidst all the absurdity, all the things that 
you can't predict, you you nevertheless feel really good. That's why I feel really fortunate to to be getting the, this feed of happiness mm-hmm. all the time. Um, well, to be or not to be, that's a good place to end it. Uh, Kelsey, you're an amazing human being. I'm really fortunate that you would spend your valuable time with me. I, I, I As I said, you're so good at not just talking, but listening. So I definitely will listen to your podcast because I can tell you're an incredible person as an interviewer and as as a storyteller. So again, thank you for talking today. Thank you so much, Bob. Thanks for listening to this conversation with Kelsey Sharon. To support this podcast, please check out our sponsors in the description. And now let me leave you with some words from Herbert Hoover. Older men declare war, but it is the youth that must fight and die. Thank you for listening and hope to see you next time. Because it's like, what is the value of what you're doing? Like, you have to answer that question or else at the end of your life, you'll have these existential, you know, kind of uh, crises, right? So when I think about like who I am, part of my identity is answering and asking scientific questions. For me, though, there is a religious kind of undercurrent that does undergird, in some sense, this quest. Again, I'm not like a practicing, I'm not like wearing a yarmulke, you know, like I'm not like full on into uh, my birth religion, Judaism. But at the same token, I think as, you know, I, one of the things Einstein did say is that, you know, religion without science is blind and uh, or is lame, and uh, science without religion is is lame, is blind and lame. Anyway, the point is that, like, you can't get meaning um, you know, from just knowing facts, like Wikipedia knows more than all of us will ever know, right? It has no wisdom, you know, wisdom, it means, you know, sapien, the word wisdom in Latin is sapien, we are wise. And by the way, do you know what we're, what is, we're, our real name is homo sapien sapien. So it's man who knows that he knows. Do you know what he knows? Do you know what the knowing is? It's that he's going to die. We're the only creatures that know that we are going to die. We don't know when we're going to die. But like, you know, I have a cat, <laughs> a fierce attack cat. It's beautiful. Um, she doesn't know when she's going to die. It doesn't mean I'm more valuable. So the, whatever, survival right? I think I am. the survival instinct is much, it's fundamentally different from like the knowledge yeah. of death. And that's where the Ernest Becker comes in Correct. with the terror of death. Correct. And that, that's a creative force that um, seems to be more feature than bug <laughs> about the, <laughs> the human condition is that... Um, I mean, it's a gift it of, of knowing our own mortality. Um, yeah, to me, I mean, that's that's why you know I I agree with you in some sense in terms of the aliens not being a thing that solves all mysteries. Mm-hmm. That's why you know my love has always been the human mind. So understanding uh, who we are, what yeah. the hell are we? And I think your love has been an echo of that, which is. Where do we come from? Yeah. Or basically, as as cheesy as it sounds, you know, uh, Michio Kaku is a way with words. I, if if oh, you yeah. if you can just like enjoy <laughs> the, uh, you know, oh, what, he speaks in complete. He's like Sam Harris of cosmology. I mean, he speaks he, in complete paragraphs. But like also unapologetically, he says, you know, we will know God or we will know the mind of God or whatever the quotes, those kinds of things. <sighs> That's exciting that physics might be able to find equations that unlock our origins yeah. at the at the very core and like the fabric of it all too and not just our origins you know what's up you know what's at the beginning um something tells me we're too dumb to truly understand what's at the beginning but i think we we should be humble in that way i mean again another thing is you know you ever hear the saying like we shared 99 percent of our dna with chimps or bonobos or whatever mm-hmm. i share like probably more than that it, you know sometimes i wish we shared like a hundred percent like that'd be so much more interesting <laughs> like we, oh well, there's 50 percent of a fruit fly or banana like we yeah. no, no no there's something but that should make us feel more precious and i almost feel like discovering life on another planet whatever solar system would cause a diminution of humanity. Like the one thing I do hold fast to from religion, I don't know where I am with God. Like, do I believe in God? I think that's an unanswerable question. Um, but but I, I have some thoughts about it. But by the, by the same token, I think 
the one thing I do get from religion is that every human has infinite worth because we are in a religious capacity considered to be equal to God. In other words, we are gods, not to be like, you know, but we can contemplate what God did. We have aspects of God. We have free will. God had free will uh, if he exists. Again, I can't prove that God exists. Otherwise, you wouldn't have any credit well, this for believing is, in God. This is interesting. I mean, this, this, it's like I'm talking to Einstein here, but let me ask anyway. Can you clip that for my clips, John? <laughs> Do you think about the end of this ride, our mortality? Do you think about your death? I do. I'll, I'll, particularly, I'm going to have um, a heart valve replacement in about seven days where I could could not make it. You know, it's a very serious operation, and I think about that very much. And um, I ask for peace. I just lost my brother about 10 days ago so unexpectedly, and that really put, you know, makes you think of your mortality. Are you afraid? Um, somewhat and some and 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 yet not. Yeah. The parts I want to live, Lex. I want <laughs> to live. <laughs> you know? This life is fun. Yes. Do you think about your death, Roger? I have visions. I have visions and they often happen very, very clear, mm. like what I have seen in the future. Scientists might call it wormholes, or in the Old Testament, they call it prophets. But I, I see sometimes into the future, around the corner, as clear as we're sitting right here. What's that look like? I was on a porch, and I believe I was in, like, Central America place. I was an old man with khaki pants and a white shirt. <laughs> and this, it was a, a chair with a wide uh, arms, and it was straight. And there was, like, the the beams coming out above my head, and I'm on a porch. Bougainvillea. <laughs> and, uh, and I— uh, I come, I, I have out of the body experiences also. And I came out of my body, just, I just floated out of my body and went into a veil mm. and like into a mist. And I believe that's probably why it happened. Mm. You talk about, you talk about like it's in your past. This is your future. No, this is in my future. <laughs> but this is something he has seen, I've you seen know, in, in the a past. Vision. Yeah. In no, I know, but it's mm. funny. Just the, yeah. the tense you use, it happened. And yet, it's something that will happen. Yes, too. Both are true. It's just unbelievable that, and I, I, I don't know how many people have it, but I have it. I, I walked out of my body, just like just where I could come up to you and look and set up on the radio. I used to be at work on the railroad, and I, I had them there. How do you explain that? What do you, what I don't do you know, think? But, what the uh, heck is going on in this mm. universe that's that's possible? Oh, I don't know, but uh, it's certainly, certainly a phenomenon that it happened. And uh, there's a guy. Bill Monroe that wrote the book on it, Out of the Body, he tells about it. And who was the guy that writes uh, The Alchemist? Mm. Oh, Those Pablo things, Coelho. Yeah, he has them also mm -hmm. just like that. And and uh, he tells about it, how it happens on him. Mine happened differently. But uh, you certainly can come out of your body. Okay. So we talked about biology. Let's, forgive me, but let's talk about philosophy for just a brief moment. So somebody I've enjoyed reading, Ernest Becker wrote The Denial of Death. There's also Martin Heidegger. There's a bunch of philosophers who um, claim that most people live life in denial of death. Sort of, we don't fully internalize the idea that we're going to die. The Because if we did, as as they say, there will be a kind of terror of, um, I mean, a, a, a deep fear of death. The fact that we don't know what's, like we almost don't know what to do with non-existence, with disappearing. Like our, the way we draw meaning from life seems to be grounded in the fact that we exist and that we at some point will not exist is terrifying. And so we live in an illusion that we're not going to die and we run from that terror. That's what Ernest Becker would say. Do you think there's any truth to that? Oh, I know there's truth to that. I experience it every day when I talk to people. Um, we have to live that way. Um, although unfortunately I, I can't, but for most people, it's extremely stressing, distressing to think about their own mortality. We think about it occasionally. And if we really thought about it every day, we'd probably be brought to tears. Mm -hmm. How much we not just miss ourselves, but miss our family, our friends. We are of all living life forms have evolved to 
to not want to die. And when I mean want, biochemically, genetically, physically, that yeast cell, the cells that I studied at MIT, they were fighting for their lives. They didn't think, but our brain has evolved the same survival aspect. Of course, we don't want to die, but the problem for us, unfortunately, it's a curse and a blessing, is that we're now conscious. We know that we're going to die. Most species that have ever existed yeah. don't. That's a burden, that's a curse. And so what I think's happened is we've evolved certainly to want to live for, for a long time, perhaps never want to die. But the thought about dying is so traumatic that there is an innate part of our brains, and it's probably genetically wired to not think about it. I really think that's part of being human. And it because you know, think about tribes that obsessed with longevity every day and that, that we're gonna die. They probably didn't make much technological progress because they were just crying in their huts every day or, you know, on the savannah. So I really think that we've evolved to naturally deny aging. And it's one of the problems that I face in my career and, you know, when I speak publicly and on social media is that it's shocking. People don't want to think about their age, but I think it's getting better. I think my, my book has helped. Uh, these tests that we're developing should help people understand it's not a problem to think about your long-term health. In fact, if you don't, you're going to reach 80 and really regret it. And the other side of it, so again, Ernest Becker, but also Victor Frankl, I recommend it highly, Man's Search for Meaning. Uh, Bernard Williams is a moral philosopher. They kind of argue that this knowledge of death, even if we often don't contemplate it, we do at times. And the very, the, what you call the curse, which I agree with you, it's a, it's a curse and a blessing that we're able to contemplate our own mortality. That gives meaning to life. So death gives meaning to life. This is what Viktor Frankl argues. I would probably argue the same. There's something about the scarcity of life and contemplating that that makes each moment that much sweeter. Is there something to that? I think it's individual. In my case, it's completely wrong. <laughs> I appreciate you saying that. <laughs> I, I don't get joy out of every day because I think I'm gonna die. Yeah, I get joy out of every day because every day is joyous and I make yeah. it that way. And even if I, would, if I thought I was gonna live forever, I would still be enjoying this moment just as much. And I bet you would too. Well, that's a, uh, I think about that a lot. I, I think um, it's very difficult to know. I'm almost afraid that I wouldn't enjoy it as much if I was immortal. I'm almost afraid to want to be immortal or to live longer because it, it perhaps is a kind of justification for me to accept that I'm going to die. It's saying like, oh, if I was immortal, I wouldn't be able to enjoy life as much as I do. But it's it's very possible that I would enjoy just as much. Um, of course, enjoying life, whether you're mortal or not, takes work. Like it it requires you to have the right kind of frame of mind. You can discover, you can focus your mind on the ugliness of life. There's plenty of ugly things in this world, and you can focus on them. You can complain. Whenever, like you know, if it's raining outside, you can you can focus on the fact that you have shelter and enjoy the, the hell out of it, or you can enjoy running in the rain when it's warm and like the, the beauty of nature, just being one with nature, or you can just complain this fucking weather again in Boston. And never, it's either always raining or freezing, damn it. And like um, the, the, same, the same thing with like Wi-Fi going out on airplanes. Like you can either complain about like <laughs> stupid Wi-Fi and on JetBlue or something, or you could say like how incredible it is that I can fly through the sky and in a matter of hours be anywhere else in the world. And that I could also on occasion watch, uh, like check email and even watch movies through this while connecting through satellites that are flying through space. So it's a matter of perspective and perhaps there's an extra level of work required when you're immortal because it's easier when you're immortal or la live longer to, uh, to be lazy, to delay stuff. But if you're not, you can still derive the same amount of joy. It's, it's possible, it's possible. It's definitely possible. In my life, I, I went from being the nothing's working to every day's great yeah. to wake up to. And I, I think even if you live, think you're gonna live forever, 
you can you can enjoy every day. What I do is everything's relative. Mm-hmm. We, we can compare ourselves to our neighbor who has more money or to the flight that should have had Wi-Fi or, which is what I do, I'm still six years old, remember. What a six-year-old does says, look, I can, when I tell my fingers to form a fist, they actually do that. <laughs> That's really cool. That's how I live my life. You know, I'm, I'm, I can pick up on your desk here this metal object. It's a metal cube, about an inch by an inch by an inch. And I, I, I tell myself, not, a, not about cubes, but about inanimate objects. Probably once a day I'll say, I am a living thing. I can think, I can move, I can eat. I am full of energy. And there's that leaf or this cube here that will never be alive. That's what I look at and compare myself to. And for as long as I live, if it's forever, of course it won't be, but even if it was forever, the relative to this lump of metal on this table here, Mm -hmm. we are wondrous things in the universe and probably the most wondrous things in the universe. Yeah, we're able to (laughs) deeply appreciate the leaf or the cube and deeply appreciate ourselves, which is, uh, it it can be a curse, but it's mostly a gift. Especially when you're, it's such a beautiful poem. Now I'm six, I'm as clever as clever, so I think I'll be six now forever and ever. That's a good thing to aspire to. Your uh, your grandmother was onto something. David, this is a incredible conversation. I'm a huge fan of your work. So thank you for wasting your valuable time with me today. I really, really appreciate it. This was awesome. Thank you for having me on, Lex. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to this conversation with David Sinclair. And thank you to Onnit, Clear, National Instruments, Simply Safe, and Linode. Check them out in the description to support this podcast. And now let me leave you with some words from Arthur Schopenhauer. All truth passes through three stages. First, it is ridiculed. Second, it is violently opposed. Third, it is accepted as being self-evident. Thank you for listening and hope to see you next time. Let me ask sort of a darker question because we're talking about Dostoevsky. We might as well. (laughs) Do you, uh, do you, and connected to the uh, freeing innocent people, do you think about mortality? Do you think about your own death? Are you afraid of death? I'm I'm not afraid of of death. I do think about it more now uh, because I'm now in my mid fifties, so I used to not think about it much at all. But uh, uh, the uh, harsh reality is that I've got more time behind me now than I do in front of me, and it kind of happens all of a sudden. To yeah. realize, wait a minute, I'm 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 actually on the back nine now. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, uh, yeah, my mind moves to it from time to time. I don't, uh, dwell on it. I'm not afraid of it. Uh, my own personal religious commitments, I'm, 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 I'm Christian and my religious, uh, uh, commitments, uh, buoy me, uh, that, uh, you know, that, that death, uh, and I, I, I believe this death is not, not, not the end. So I'm not afraid of it. Now, this is not to say that I want to, I want to I want to rush to the afterlife. I'm I'm good right here for a long time. I hope I've got, you know, 30, 35, 40 more years to go. Uh but um but uh but no, I don't I don't really I, I don't fear death. Uh, we 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 we're, we're finite creatures. We're we're all going to we're all going to die. Well, the mystery of it uh you know, for for somebody at least, at least for me, we human beings want to figure everything out. Uh, whatever the afterlife is, there's still a mystery to it. That that uncertainty, yeah. it can be terrifying if you ponder it. But maybe uh, what you're saying is, <laughs> uh, you haven't pondered it too deeply so far, and it's worked out pretty good. It's worked out, yeah. No, no, no complaints. <laughs> In the Tao of Wu, you write, "When my mother left the physical world, I lost one of my main links to the universe." They say that you have an umbilical cord and an etheric cord, which is the invisible cord that attaches you to your soul, your mother's soul, and all other souls. When one passes away, you really lose something. It's physical and mental. It's real. Part of you dies. 
What have you learned about life from your mother? I mean, I learned life itself from my mother. You know, being one of 11 children and seeing the sacrifice that she gave to us, therefore given to life, uh, it's really the greatest lesson of life. The thing that uh, shook me as I wrote those words was coming up young with arrogance, confidence, knowledge of myself. They called me the scientist. We was taught you're the supreme being. In order to be the supreme being, you got to be supreme amongst other beings. Mm -hmm. um, I understand that more now than I did then because then I, it was so literal. You know, the word God derived basically from the Greek language, as they say, and it meant wisdom, strength, and beauty. And yeah, we could have that. But the power to control life and death is something that you would assume is a God trait. So now here you are saying that you're a God, right? And you're reading the Bible, how Jesus brought back Lazarus. And, you know, now here's your turn to do something. And when my mother was laying there in the hospital bed, and air was no longer coming out of her lungs and going into her lungs, where's my power to bring her back to life? So you can't truly be God. You're powerless. Yeah, or God is not the definition that we need to use to describe it because it's a translation of wisdom, strength, and beauty. So you could be that. But uh, so I'm answering your question, what did my mother teach me about life? I learned that day on her physical passing, that, okay. And I mean, there's a physical me. Do you think about her, do you miss her? Of course. I keep my mother in my prayer every day. And the thing I pray the most uh, beyond giving thanks is I pray that her name is honored and remembered by my family. I don't know if the world's going to remember her, right? Even though if you watch my movie, Love Beats Rhymes, I named the school in that movie <laughs> after my mother just yeah. to leave it somewhere else. <laughs> yeah, in physical space. Yeah, yeah exactly. But yeah, <laughs> painful. The pain of my mother's passing is indescribable. Only until it happens to a person, they know, and then they won't describe it either. Only the people that lost their mother, they could look at each other and they got this nod. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, but one other thing happened to me was the joy of life hit me differently. And I think it was the realization of my own mortality versus my immortality. It's a big, big thing. And I don't know if we'll get to expound on that, but there was a joy that overcame me because I was kind of free of a certain illusion about the immortality of my physical being versus the mortality of my physical being. And I was like, okay, wow, I understand. So that was the first or the hardest realization you've experienced that you're mortal. Yeah, that, yeah. And I'll say mortal... And the, what you're looking at here physically, I won't say my soul is mortal, right? I'll say it's immortal because at the end of the day, it's just like I could sit here and I could just hum, please, 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 by James Brown. But James Brown is not going to come in here and do that. So in some sense, James Brown is still here. In another sense, he's gone. Here. So, <laughs> the soul is here. Well, it lives through you by you singing it. It lives through you by you listening to it, celebrating it. And the hope is that uh, the human species continues to celebrate the, the the great minds and the great creations of the past. I would add this to that equation. When I say it's immortal, I don't think not just only because somebody sings it, right? It's like, why is, where's the fire at right now? 
it's in the air. You just gotta spark the spark. <laughs> yeah. So it's always there. Are you afraid of death? No, I'm not afraid of death. I ain't, I'm not. I'm not trying to see it. You know, <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> I'm not rushing that nowhere near me, right? Because all I know is life, right? My life is living. Um, you know, I read a lot of ancient texts. As people probably know about me, and I love one of the great teachers named Bodhi Dharma. Uh, and, and there was a th thing written in you know one of the uh, books of his or one of the teachings of his, and the question somebody asked him. Similar question, you know, you're scared of death or what are you going to be after you die? And his answer was, I don't know. He had answers to everything. But he's like, I don't know. They said, oh, he doesn't know that. So yeah, because I haven't died yet. Yeah. Well, the uncertainty to some people is terrifying, not knowing what's on the other side of the door. Yeah. I mean, especially when you're young, you know, as a kid, fear permeated my life. You know what I mean? You know, I was actually watching horror movies and mm -hmm. I believed in all type of uh, supernatural things that could or can happen. I thought I saw things as well. And, uh, you know, whether it was being projected from my own mind or whether it was there visible to me, I don't know, right? Um, but life is beautiful and we have it and we should use it all the way to the last drop. Realizing the mortality, the the gift your mother gave to you is realizing the immortal, and in so doing, help you realize that life is beautiful. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, uh, let me ask you about the the ultimate down, which is uh, unfortunately we humans are mortal, <laughs> or appear to be for the most part. Uh, do you think about your own mortality? Do you do you fear death? I hope so, and I do, <laughs> <laughs> because I mean, without death, there is no life. So at least there is no meaningful life. And death is actually, in some sense, our uh, ultimate motivator <laughs> to live a, a beautiful and uh, meaningful life. I myself felt as a young man that uh, unless I, I got something that I wanted to do, I don't know why I got this idea, this idea of something to say. If I'm not able to say, I would suicide. So, Maybe it was a way to motivate myself. <laughs> but you don't need to motivate it because in some sense, fortunately, death is there. So you better get up and do your thing and uh, because <laughs> that is the best motivation to, to live fully. Well, what do you think, uh, what do you hope your legacy is? <sighs> you know, uh, you, my... you mentioned you have two kids. Yes. And so I really feel that, you know, there is, uh, on one side is my biological uh, legacy and that is, uh, my two kids, right? And, uh, and their kids, hopefully. <laughs> and that is one fine. And the other thing is, uh, this uh, common, uh, enterprise, which is, uh, society. And I really feel that my legacy would be better by providing uh, security and privacy actually for me are metaphorical to say i want to give you the ability to interact more and take more risks and uh, and reach out to more for more people as difficult and dangerous as it may seem but my, my whole uh, scientific work is about to to guarantee privacy and and give you the security of interaction and uh, not only in a transaction, like it would be a blockchain transaction, but uh, that is really one of the hardcore of my emotional problems. And I think of it, you know, uh, these are the problems I want to tackle. Yeah, and ultimately privacy and security is freedom. And yes. Freedom is at the core of this. Uh, like, it's uh, dangerous, just it's like the emotion thing. Uh, the emotion <laughs> thing, yeah. Uh, but ultimately that's how we create all the beautiful things. So we talk quite a bit about the definitions of religion and what are the different building blocks of religion. So one of the, I don't think we touched on, we did a little bit with the afterlife, but in the sense, I don't know if you're familiar with the Ernest Becker work and all the philosophies around there about the fear of death and how the a fear of our own mortality 
awareness of our own mortality and its fear is, in case of Ernest Becker, uh, is a, a significant component in the psychology, in the way we humans develop our understanding of the world. So what are your thoughts in the context of religion or maybe in the context of your own mind about the role of death in life or fear of death in life? And are you afraid of death? <laughs> Diana, We cover Polk. everything in this <laughs> podcast. Every single topic is covered. <laughs> wow. Okay. Um, I so happen to have benefited perhaps from living with an older brother who seemingly had no fear of death while growing up. And he did everything, okay? So he was, he climbed mountains. He was a rock climber. He jumped out of airplanes. Of course, he had to be a Green Beret and go into the special forces where that type of thing is a, a requirement, right? And so because of that, I did a lot of things outside of my comfort zone, and which probably I shouldn't have done. And hope hope to goodness my kids don't do them. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So do you, so I do I fear death? Um, I think about death a lot, actually. Um, you may not know this about me, but in my field, I was the head, I was the co-chair of the death panel. So <laughs> it's called the death panel. <laughs> no, it's like it's the uh, panel to think about death in religious studies. Um and I was that for many years. So you've thought about it a bit. A bit. Let's see. I think that people are a little too confident, I think, about life in general, that they're going to kind of live all the time mm -hmm. and not die. I happen to, I mean, I hate to say it, I'm super positive and most people would consider me to be too happy almost, right? <laughs> and so it's odd then that I spend a lot of time thinking about death, but I wonder if there's a connection there. Yeah. I'm happy to be alive. Right? Yeah, that, that that's kind of what the thinking about death does is it makes you appreciate the days that you do have. Yeah, that's a it's a weird controversy. I I tend to believe that um, the fact that this life ends gives each day um, a significant amount of meaning. So I don't know. Uh, it seems like an important feature of life. It's not like a bug. It's, it seems like a feature that it ends. But it's a strange feature because I wish it, like all the good stuff, you wish it wouldn't end. Well, you know what's interesting, Lex, and I do point this out to my students because we cover in a lot of the basic studies courses I teach, we cover all religions or as many as we can, like the major religions. And so take Hinduism, for example. Um, now, this is an ancient religion, okay? So you and I are here talking about how we enjoy living and life and things like that. Well, the goal of Hinduism is basically never to get reincarnated again. It's basically to not live, okay? Yeah. And to get off samsara, which is the wheel of life and death. Yeah. So escape the whole Yeah, exactly. Thing. Can think of that. Conditions are so different that you and I and my students are happy to be alive. But they're back in the day, you know, thousands of years ago when they wrote when they actually didn't write it, they spoke the Vedas, which were the sacred traditions of India. They wanted off. They didn't want to come back. Life was terrible. That's what people don't have the adequate understanding of history, that for the majority of people, life is really hard, right? And you and I are, and your audience, among the lucky. Yeah. That we actually life, like life. We want to live. <laughs> Most of the time. Yeah. Your packet of information that you've continually referred to as Sarah afraid of the dissipation of the death of that packet? Are you afraid of death? Do you ponder death? Does um, death have meaning in this process of yeah. uh, creativity? I think I have the natural biological urge that everyone has to fear death. Um, I think the thing that I think is interesting is if I think about it rationally, I'm not necessarily afraid of death for me because I won't be aware of being dead. <laughs> Um, but I am afraid, like, for my kids because it matters to them if I die. Um, so, so again, like, I think death becomes more significant as a collective property, not as an individual one. Yeah, but isn't there something to fear about the fact that the way, like, the creative, uh, 
the complexity of information that's been like created in you. Yeah. The the, the fact that it kind of breaks apart and, and disappears. Into, it doesn't, into, but I don't think it disappears. It's just not me anymore. Right. So you're, but the that process of you it being not you anymore that doesn't scare you. Of course it does. The mystery of it. I mean, the... Yeah. But I guess I'm heartened by the fact that there will be some imprints of the fact that I existed still in the universe after I leave it. Yeah, as but me. There'll, there'll be a... Well, okay. But and the, also that has to do with my perception of time, right? So, you know, I perceive time as flowing, but that might not be the case. I mean, this is, you know, f standard physicist comfort is, you know, every time moment exists, you know, and is, you know, there's no... And the flow of time is just our perception of you know, us, um, you know, us changing. Um, so you can travel back in time and that's comforting? Like from a physicist's concept? No, 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 I'm not talking about traveling back in time. I'm just saying that the moments in the past still exist. Um, now, whether the moments in the future exist or not is a different question. That's not comforting to me in terms of death. I, with the, <laughs> the flow of time is not, that does not. I, I think, uh, I think it's, I think there's no comfort in the face of death for what we are. Uh, because we like existing. And I think it's especially true if you if you love life and you love what life is. Do you think there's a certain sense in which the fear of death or the fear of non-existence, maybe fear is not the right word, is the actual very phenomena that gives birth to existence? Like maybe. death is fundamental. Like this, it just feels like freaking out, oh shit, yeah. this ride ends, is actually like, the, the, the that's that's the thing that gives birth to this all, this whole thing yeah that, that like it's constantly is, is matter constantly freaking out about the fact that it's gonna no, be no i think i think things like to exist i think they want to exist yeah there's a you, yeah. Th there's a desire whatever yeah. to exist yeah and there's a drive to exist and there's a drive for more things to exist. I guess, um, yeah, I would like, to, I like existing. I like, I like, I like it a lot. Um, and I don't know it any other way. <laughs> but, I, uh, see, I don't even know if I like existing. I think I really don't like not existing. Yes. Yeah, that too. <laughs> I, yeah. The, yeah, maybe it's that. I, some days I, you know, I'm, I might like existing less than others, but... <laughs> Yes, but like I think those are like surface feelings. There is yeah, some, yeah. seems like there's something fundamental about wanting to exist. No, I think that's right. But I, but I think to your point that 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 might go back to the more fundamental idea that you know if life is the physics of existence and maximizing existence, individual organisms, of course, want to maximize their existence, and everything you know like wants to exist. But I, I guess for me, the small comfort is my existence matters to future existence. <laughs> Do you think about your own mortality? Are I you do. afraid of death? I'm not afraid. I'm not looking forward to it. I don't want to rush it because I feel like I got some things I can still do here. But as a person of faith, I don't think I'm afraid. I'm 71. I know I don't have an infinite amount of time left. And I want to use the time I've got uh, in some sort of way that matters. I'm not ready to become a full-time golfer. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but I don't quite know what that is. I do feel that I've had a chance uh, to do amazingly powerful things as far as experiences, and maybe God has something else in mind. I wrote this book 16 years ago, uh, The Language of God, about science and faith, trying to explain how, from my perspective, these are compatible, these are in harmony they're complementary if you are careful about which kind of question you're asking. And to my surprise, a lot of people seem to be interested in that. They were tired of hearing the extreme voices um, like Dawkins at one end and uh, people like Ken Ham and Answers in Genesis on the other end saying, if you trust science, you're going to hell. And they thought there must be a way that these things could get along. And that's what I tried to put forward. And then I started a foundation, BioLogos, which then I had to step away from uh, to become NIH director, which has just flourished, maybe because I stepped away, I don't know. <laughs> but it now has millions of people who come uh, to that website and they run amazing meetings. And I think a lot of people have really come to a sense that this is okay, I can love science and I can love God, and that's not a bad thing. 
So maybe there's something more I can do in that space. Um, maybe that book is ready for a second edition. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> but when you look back, life is finite. What do you hope your legacy is? Hmm. I don't know. This whole legacy thing seems a little <laughs> bit hard to embrace. It feels a little self-promoting, doesn't it? I sort of feel like in many ways I went to my own funeral on October 5th uh, when I announced that I was stepping down and I got the most amazing responses from people, some of whom I knew really well, some of whom I didn't know at all, uh, who were just telling me stories about something that I had contributed to that made a difference to them. And that was incredibly heartwarming. And that's enough. You know, <laughs> I, I don't want to build an edifice. I don't have a plan for a monument or a statue. God help us. Uh, I do feel like I've been incredibly fortunate. I've had the chance uh, to play a role in things that were pretty profound uh, from the Genome Project to NIH to COVID vaccines. And I ought to be plenty satisfied that I've had enough experiences here to feel pretty good about the way in which my life panned out. Yes. You've mentioned uh, life is short. Do you think about um, your mortality? Are you afraid of death? Uh, I don't think about my mortality. Um, uh, I think that I don't think about my death. Uh, and I don't think about death in general too much. First of all, it's something that I can't do much about. And I think it's something that it doesn't, it doesn't drive my everyday action. It is natural to expect that it's somewhat like the time reversal situation. So we believe that we have this approximate symmetry in nature, time reversal. Yeah. Going forward, we die. Going backwards, we get born. Yeah. So what was it to get born? It wasn't such a good or bad feeling. I have no feeling of it. So, you know, who knows what the death will feel like, uh, the moment of death or whatnot. So I don't know. It is not known. But yeah. uh, in what form do we exist before or after? Again, it's something that it's uh, it's partly philosophical, maybe. I like how you draw comfort from symmetry. It does seem that there is something asymmetric here, a breaking of symmetry, because there, <laughs> there's there's something to the um, creative force of the human spirit that goes only one way. Right. That it seems the finiteness of life is the thing that drives the creativity. And so it does seem that that... Um, at least the contemplation of, of the finiteness of life, of mortality, is a thing that helps you get your <laughs> stuff together. Yes, I, th I think that's true. But actually, I have a different perspective on that a little bit. Yes. Namely, uh, suppose I told you you have, you're immortal. Yes. I think your life would be totally boring after that because you will not, there's, I think part of the reason we have enjoyment in life is the finiteness of it. Yes. And so I think mortality might be a blessing and immortality may not. So I think that we value things because we have that finite life. We, we appreciate things. We want to do this. We want to do that. We have motivation. If I told you, you know, you have infinite life. Oh, I don't, I don't need to do this today. I have another <laughs> a billion or trillion or infinite life. So why do yeah. I do now? There is no motivation. A lot of the things that we do are driven by that finiteness, this finiteness of these resources. So I think it is a blessing in disguise. I don't regret it that we have a more uh, finite life. And I think um, I think that the the process of uh, being part of this thing, that you know, the the reality, to me, part of what attracts me to science is to connect to that immortality kind of, namely mm -hmm. the laws, the reality beyond us. To me, I'm 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 resigned to the fact that not only me, everybody is going to die. So this gives a little bit of a consolation. None of us <laughs> are going to be around. So therefore, okay, yeah. and none of none of the people before me are around. So yeah. therefore, yeah, okay, this is this is something everybody goes through. So so taking that minuscule version of okay, how tiny we are and how short time it is and so on, to connect to the deeper truth beyond us, the reality beyond us, is what sense of quote unquote, immortality I would get. Namely, I at least I can hang on to this little piece of truth, even though I know, I know it's not complete. I know it's going to be imp imperfect. I know it's going to change and it's going to be improved. But having a little bit deeper insight than, than just the naive thing around us, little earth here and little galaxy and so on, makes me feel a little bit more, uh, 
more pleasure to to live this life. So I think yeah. that's the way I view my my role as a scientist. Yeah, the the scarcity of this life helps us appreciate the beauty of the the immortal, the universal truths uh, of that physics present us. And maybe maybe one day physics will will have something to say about that uh, that beauty in itself, explaining why the heck. It's so beautiful to appreciate the laws of physics, and yet, um, why it's so tragic that we uh, we, we die so quickly. <laughs> yes, we die so quickly. So that can be a bit longer. That's for sure. <laughs> it would be very nice. Maybe <laughs> physics will help out. Well, come on. It was uh, an incredible conversation. Thank you so much once again for painting a beautiful picture of the history of physics, and it kind of presents a hopeful. Um, view of the future of physics. So I, I really, really appreciate that. It's a huge honor that you would talk to me and waste all your valuable time with me. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Lex. It was a pleasure. And I love talking with you. And this is a wonderful set of discussions. I, I really enjoyed my time with this discussion. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this conversation with Comrade Vafa. And thank you to Headspace, Jordan Harmerger Show, Squarespace, and Allform. Check them out in the description to support this podcast. And now, let me leave you with some words from the great Richard Feynman. Physics isn't the most important thing. Love is. Thank you for listening and hope to see you next time. Do you think about your mortality? Are you afraid of death? So, fear of death is like one of the most fundamental fears that each of us has. We might be not even aware of it. It requires to look inside to even recognize that it's um, out there. Um, there is still, let's say, this property of uh, nature that if things would last forever, then they would be also boring to us. Mm -hmm. The fact that the things change in some way gives any meaning to them. I also, you know, found out that... Uh, it seems to be very healing to people to have these short experiences, uh, like I guess psychedelic experiences in which they experience death of self, mm -hmm. in which they let go of this fear and then maybe can even increase the appreciation of the moment. Uh, it seems that many people, they... Uh, they they can easily comprehend fine uh, the fact that the money is finite, mm -hmm. while they don't see that time is finite. I, I have this like a discussion with Ilya from time to time. He's like, you know, man, like uh, the life will pass very fast. At some point, I will be 40, 50, 60, 70, and then it's over. This is true, which also makes me believe that you know, that every single moment it is so unique that should be appreciated. And it's also makes me think that I should be acting mm -hmm. on my life because otherwise it will pass. I also like this framework of thinking from Jeff Bezos on regret minimization mm -hmm. that like I would like if I will be at the deathbed to look back on my life and, um, and not regret that I haven't done something. It's usually, you might regret that you haven't tried. I'm fine with failing. But I haven't tried. Yeah. Uh, well, it's the Nietzsche eternal recurrence. Tried to live a life that if you had to live it infinitely many times, that would be the, you'd be okay with that kind of life. So try to live it optimally. I can say that it's almost, like um, unbelievable to me where I am in my life. I'm extremely grateful for actually people whom I met. I would say I think that I'm decently smart and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that uh, actually to great extent where I am has to do with the people who I met. Would you be okay if after this conversation you died? So... If I'm dead, then it kind of, I don't have a choice anymore. So in some sense, there's like a plenty of things that I would like to try out in my life. Mm -hmm. I feel that, you know, I'm gradually going one by one and I'm just doing them.
Uh, I think that the list will be always infinite. Yeah. So might as well go today. Yeah, I mean, to be clear, I'm not looking forward to die. I would say if there is no choice, I would accept it. But like uh, in some sense, I'm uh, if there would be a choice, uh, if there would be possibility to leave, I would fight for living. I find um, it's more honest and real to think about, you know, dying today at the end of the day. That seems to me, to at least to my brain, more honest slap in the face, as opposed to I still have ten years, like today. Then, then I'm much more about appreciating the cup and the table and so on, and less about like silly worldly accomplishments and all those kinds of things. We 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 have in the company a person who, say, at some point, found out that they have cancer. Yeah. And that also gives, you know, huge perspective with respect to what matters now. Yeah. And, you know, often people in situations like that, they conclude that actually what matters is human connection. And love. And uh, that's people conclude also if you have kids, it's kids, it's family. You, uh, I think, tweeted, we don't assign the minus infinity reward to our death. Such a reward would prevent us from taking any risk. We wouldn't be able to cross a road in fear of being hit by a car. So in the objective function, you mentioned fear of death might be fundamental to the human condition. So as I said, let, let's assume that they're like a reward functions in our brain. And, uh, and the interesting thing is even realization, how different reward functions can play with your behavior. As a matter of fact, I wouldn't say that you should assign infinite negative reward to anything because that messes up the math. So the math doesn't work out. It doesn't work out. And it's, uh, <laughs> okay. as you said, even, you know, uh, government or some insurance companies, you said they assign nine, bill, uh, nine million dollars to human life. Yeah. And I'm just saying it with respect to, that might be a hard statement to ourselves, but in some sense that there is a finite value of our own life. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to put it from perspective of being less, uh, of being more egoless yeah. uh, and realizing fragility of my own life. And uh, in some sense, the fear of death might prevent you from acting because anything can cause death. Yeah, and I'm, I'm sure actually, if you were to put death in the objective function, there's probably so many aspects to death and fear of death and uh, realization of death and mortality. There's just whole components of finiteness of not just your life, but every experience and so on that you're going to have to formalize mathematically. And also, you know, that might lead to um, you spending a lot of compute cycles on this, like a, a deliberating this terrible future instead of experiencing now. <laughs> and then in some sense, it's also kind of unpleasant simulation to run in your head. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Are you uh, afraid of death? I mean, it's easy for me to say no, as I sit here, probably not about to die, but... Is this like the UFC question, can you defeat any opponent? Exactly. The answer, the answer is yes. The answer is, of course, yes. And uh, I don't have... They're not around. They're not here, are they? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but... Uh, I mean, are you, uh, do you ponder your own mortality? Maybe another context to that is you mentioned two deaths for martial artists. I think that's actually why, honestly, even though at, at a relatively young age, I think mortality is something that I'm aware of, more, maybe more than the average person. I think probably most athletes can speak to this, and anyone that's had trouble. I've managed to, to slide out of a couple near-death experiences personally, you know, mostly river-related um, because I'm an idiot. But... Um, I regret nothing, but, uh, yeah, and, yeah but, uh, thank God we're here. But, um, yeah, it, it is an interesting seeing, seeing the end and seeing going, well, what's going to happen. I, I guess, I, I think it comes back to kind of what we were discussing about belief structure and belief system. I, I think a lot of times if I recognize that no matter what I do, it's all going to end one day. And then you go, well, why were we here? What would I do? Am, as, am I going to make it to 40? I have no idea. I'd like to hope so. I had no idea that I was going to make it to, to the age that I am now. Um, am I going to make it to 80? How much of that is in my control? 
much of it is not. I mean, we, we, it's so funny. It's an interesting, like back to the belief structure, again, like locus of internal and external locus of control, you know, what's facilitative versus what's true. And, you know, I think accepting personal responsibility for more than is on my control is, is probably a positive, but at the same time, recognizing that much of much is not in my control. I was fortunate enough to be born in the United States, fortunate enough to, you know, to not to knock on wood, have, have a serious disease that I'm not aware of right now. Um, I didn't do any of that. I just showed up. That was really fortunate. And I, I guess that doesn't diminish the fact that I've tried to make decent choices, but it works in concert with it. And I, I guess um, when I, when you go, is death what I want right now? No, no, I should think not. And again, it's easy for me to be relatively calm about it as I'm not staring it in the face. But what I would care a lot more about is, is how you live. That's what's in my control. And I can't control if as I walk out of this building, a helicopter falls on me. Worrying about that, I can't control. Maybe I, maybe I have cancer now and I don't know it. And I really hope not. But um, there's something about meditating on the fact that it could end today outside right. of your control that can uh, clarify your thinking about yeah. the the fact that life is amazing. Like just kind of uh, yeah, helping you enjoy this moment. Even if life was horrible, let's say for instance, it was it was you live at one of those times or places, and those places still exist in this world today. That life is brutal and metal and whatever all and short and painful. Would you still want it? And again, as I'm sitting here, not not on fire physically, it's easy to say yes. But I would, I'm confident. I still, I'll plant my feet and say yes. Any of li any life is amazing and beautiful and and a, and a gift, an unbelievable gift uh, with, that none of us have earned. <laughs> for the record, and we're, I hate the word earned. A lot of times, earned, yeah, you earn, but it's like there's a lot of a lot of good fortune and earning. And that's back to do I want justice or do I want grace? And I guess we're all fortunate to be where we are, no matter where we are. And hopefully it should give us some sense of perspective, some sense of compassion for other people, but also like, like you said, a sense of peace where if it all ended right now, would I be happy with what I, with a life to this point? I'm like, of course, would you like to live a little longer? Yeah, I would try to do more and try to live rightly to the best that I know how, which over time will hopefully continue to evolve in a, in a positive direction. But if the answer to that is no, I, I guess uh, that's that's always that's a sign that that what I'm doing is not what I'm meant to be doing. And I mean, you're familiar with the Tecumseh before. Uh, so there's a I've got one actually. If you could give me ten seconds, I'll I'll read this one out. This is a personal favorite, basically, and I, I think it sums up. I mean, again, I, it's one of those quotes on the internet, like when Abraham Lincoln said, "Don't believe everything you read online." Um, but uh, this is you know, I it's again, uh, attributed, but it's like, so live your life that the fear of death can never enter your heart. Trouble no one about their religion, respect others in their view, and demand that they respect yours. Love your life, perfect your life, beautify all things in your life. Seek to make your life long and its purpose in the service of your people. Prepare a noble death song for the day when you go over the great divide. Always give a word or sign a salute when meeting or passing a friend, even a stranger when in, when in a lonely place. Show respect to all people and grovel to none. When you arise in the morning, give thanks for the food and for the joy of living. If you see no reason for giving thanks, the fault lies only in yourself. Abuse no one and no thing, for abuse turns the wise ones to fools and robs the spirit of its vision. When it comes your time to die, be not like those whose hearts are filled with the fear of death, so that when their time comes, they weep and pray for a little more time to live their lives over again in a different way. Sing your death song and die like a hero going home. Powerful words. I don't think there's a better way to end it. Let me just say, uh, we've spoke maybe five, six years ago. I don't even remember when, but I'm not exaggerating saying like you had a huge impact on my life because of the podcast. You're the reason I was doing the podcast as long as I have. You're the reason I'm doing this podcast. And it's a little, it's a stupid little meeting that you probably didn't know who I was. I didn't really know who you are. It was just like a magical moment. It's a flap of a butterfly wing kind of situation. And uh, yeah, I'm forever grateful. You're one of the most inspiring people in my life. So Ryan, it's a huge honor that you would come here, uh, Jen, and talk with me and waste all this time. I really appreciate it. It was amazing. Thank you so much, Lex. It's just been a pleasure. I really appreciate you having us on. Thank you. Thanks, brother. Thanks for listening to this conversation with Ryan Hall, and thank you to our sponsors, PowerDot, Babbel, and Cash App. 
Please check out these sponsors in the description to get a discount and to support this podcast. If you enjoy this thing, subscribe on YouTube, review it with five stars on Apple Podcasts, follow on Spotify, support on Patreon, or connect with me on Twitter at Lex Friedman. And now let me leave you with some words from Frank Herbert in Dune. Deep in the human unconscious is a pervasive need for a logical universe that makes sense. But the real universe is always one step beyond logic. Thank you for listening and hope to see you next time. Can I ask you a question about this uh, human <laughs> contention with death, this uh, confrontation of death that seems to be at the core of things? I, I don't know how deep to the core, but um, it seems to be a central element of the human condition. What do you think about Ernest Becker and uh, those guys that put put death at the, what is it, the warm at the core, which uh, as the main thing, uh, the main, create like this confrontation of our own mortality. First of all, being understand that we're mortal and then confronting the terror of it, the, the fear of it as the creative, like trying to escape the fear of death as the creative force of human society. It's like the reason we do anything is because we're just running away from our death, scared. Mm. Uh, do you find some of that to be true? First of all, as a somebody who looks in the mirror, looks at yourself and your own as a human being, two, just looking at society today, and three, at this whole big s spread of human history and all the cool stuff we've created, including the mysteries of Eleusis. I wonder what life would look like in the absence of the fear of our mortality. I wonder how we'd interact with one another if there was relatively little or no fear of death. I, re I really do when it comes to Becker's work and others. Um, if the ancients were known for anything, it was running to death. It was the opposite. In fact, dying before dying, which is the immortality key, by the way. It's not psychedelics. But when, I, when I refer to this key, I'm referring to this notion that's preserved in Greek. An pethanis, prin pethanis, denta pethanis, otan pethanis. If you die before you die, you won't die when you die. For some reason, the ancients prized that experience. And we talked about the mystics of, of Sufism and Kabbalism and Christian mysticism, where you have this, this same self nodding, this death before death, the divine nothingness, right? Mm -hmm. For some reason, the mystic saints, visionaries, and ancient philosophers, they ran to death. And the one message I wanted to try and communicate with this book is how they viewed life, um, that it can only be fully experienced, fully embodied in the wake of a really intense, perhaps terrifying, but utterly transformational encounter with death. So running to death, not running away from death. Are you afraid of death? Let's start with an easy question. <laughs> There's no warm up. That's it. We're, we're no warm up. No jumping jacks. <laughs> let's uh, let's break that down into two questions. Um, I'm a human being, and like any human being, I'm biologically programmed to be terrified of death. Every physical element in our bodies is designed to keep us away from death. Um, I'm no different from anyone else in that regard. If you throw me from the top of the Empire State Building. I'm going to scream all the way down to the concrete. Um, if you wave a loaded firearm in my face, I'm going to flinch away in horror the same way anyone else would. Um, so in that first sense of, are you afraid of death? Uh, my my body is terrified of injury leading to death the same way any, any other human being would. So when death is imminent, there's a terror that yeah, I, I death, go through the same right. adrenaline dumps that you would go through. Yeah. Um, uh, but on the other hand, you're also asking a much deeper question, which is presumably, are you afraid of non-existence? What yeah. comes after your physical death? And that's the more interesting question. Um, no, uh, I should start right uh, by, by, by saying from, from the start, uh, I'm a materialist. I, I don't believe that we have an immortal soul. I don't believe there's a life after our physical death. Um, in this sense, from someone who starts from that point of view, you have to understand that everyone has two deaths. 
We always talk about our death as though there was only one. But we all have two deaths. There was a time before you were born when you were dead. You weren't afraid of that period of non-existence. You don't even think about it. So why would you be afraid of your second period of non-existence? You came from non-existence. You're going to go back into it. You weren't afraid of the first. Why are you somehow afraid of the second? So it doesn't really make sense to me as to why people would be afraid of, of non-existence. You dealt with it fine the first time. Um, deal with it the second time. But your mind didn't exist for the first death. And it won't exist after you die either. But it does exist now enough to comprehend that there's this thing that you know nothing about that's coming, which is non-existent. Actually, you do know about it because you know what it was like before you were born. It was just nothing. Like you, every 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 time you go to sleep at night, you get a sneak preview of death. It's just this kind of nothing happens. You wake up in the morning, you're you're alive again. But it's not about the sleeping. It's about the falling asleep. And every night when you fall asleep you assume you're going to wake up. Here you know you're not waking up. And the knowledge of but that- But there's a whole step from that to the idea of fearing it. I'm fully aware that there's gonna be a time I don't wake up, but are you gonna be afraid of it? Is there some mortal terror you have of this? No, you didn't have it before. You don't have it when you sleep. Um, going from the fact that you know you won't wake up to terror is two different things. That's an extra step. And at that point, you're, you're making a choice at that, uh, at that point. What about what some people in our in this context we might call like the third death, which is when um, everybody forgets the entirety of consciousness in the universe forgets that you've ever existed, that John Donahue ever existed. So it's almost like a cosmic death. That's like everything goes. Yeah, not not just. I, I would say it's like knowledge. The history books forget mm -hmm. about who you are. Because the history books... This is inevitable, by the way. We're all very, very small players in a very big game. And inevitably, we're all going to go at some point. Yeah, but doesn't... So you're... It's, it's disappointing, of course. Like it, it's, um, <laughs> but, but it's not even... It, it would be arrogance to say, um, I'm disappointed in the idea that I will disappear. But there's, there's far greater things than me that will disappear. I mean, it, it, it's crushing to think that there's gonna come a time when no one will ever hear Beethoven's symphonies again. That the, the mysteries of the pharaohs will be lost and no one will even comprehend that they once existed. Like humanity has come up with so many amazing things over its existence. And to think that one day this is just all happening on a tiny speck in a distant corner of a very small uh, galaxy and among millions of galaxies that this is all for nothing. Okay, I can understand. There's a kind of dread that comes with this. Um, uh, but there's also a sense in which the moment you're born and the moment you can think about these things, you know this is your inevitable fate. Is it so inevitable? So if we look at, uh, we're in Austin and there's a guy named Elon Musk and he's hoping, in fact, that is the drive behind many of his passions is the human beings becoming multiplanetary species and expanding out exploring and colonizing the solar system, the galaxy, and maybe the rest of the universe. Is that something that fills you with excitement? Uh, it's As a project, it's very exciting. I, um, uh, the whole idea, I mean, we all grew up with science fiction, the idea of, uh, of exploration, the same way uh, human beings in earlier centuries were thrilled at the idea of discovering a new world, you know, America or some other part of the world that they sail to and come back but now instead of sailing oceans you're, you're sailing solar systems and uh, ultimately even, even further um so of course that's exciting but as far as relieving us from non-existence it's just playing a, a delaying game because ultimately even the universe itself if the laws of thermodynamics are correct will ultimately die of course we might not understand most of uh, the physics and how the universe functions. You said laws of thermodynamics, but maybe that's just a tiny little fraction of what the universe actually is. Maybe there's multiple dimensions, maybe maybe there's multiple universes, maybe the entirety of this experience. You know, there's guys like Donald Hoffman that think that all of this is just an illusion, that we don't, like, 
human cognition and perception constructs a whole, it's like a video game that we construct that's very distant from the actual reality. And maybe one day we'll understand that reality. Maybe it'll be like the matrix kind of thing. So there, there's a lot of different possibilities here. And there's also a philosopher named Ernest Becker. I don't know if you know who that is. He wrote uh, Denial of Death. And his idea, he disagrees with you, but he's dead now, uh, <laughs> is, is that he thinks that the terror of death, the terror of the knowledge that we're going to die is within all of us and is in fact the driver behind most of the creativity that we do. Exploring out into the universe, but also you becoming one of the great scholars of the martial arts, the philosophers of fighting, is because you're actually terrified of death and you want you want to somehow permeate like your knowledge, your ideas, your essence to permeate human civilization so that even when your body dies, you live on. Mm. I would agree with him insofar as uh, death is the single greatest motivator for action. But going beyond that and saying that it's somehow terrifying, that's, that's an extra step on his part. Um, and not everyone's going to follow him on that step. I do believe that death is the single most important element in life that gives value to our days. If you think, for example, of a situation where a god came to you and gave you immortality, life would be very, very different for you. Uh, you're uh, a talented uh, research scientist. Um, you work to a schedule. Why? Because ultimately you know your life is finite and actually very finite. And could be even more so if, if fate plays its hand and you uh, uh, die an early death or what have you. We never know what's going to happen tomorrow. Um, as such, we get work done uh, as soon as we can. The moment you gain immortality, you can always put every project off. You can always say, I don't need to do this today because I can do it four centuries from now. Mm -hmm. And as you extend artificially a human life, the motivation to get things done here and now and work industriously and, and excel fades away because you can always come back to the idea that you can do this in the future. And so what gives value to our days is ultimately death and value it's not the only form of uh, the only reason behind value but a huge part of what we consider value is scarcity and death gives us scarcity of days and is probably the single greatest motivator for almost every action we partake in it's kind of tragic and beautiful that what what makes things amazing is that they end <laughs> yeah, I think it would actually be a terrible burden to be immortal. You would, um, life would be in many ways very hollow and meaningless, I think. People talk about death taking away the meaning of life, but I think immortality would have a very similar effect in a different direction. I mean, look, in our world, all we really have is credit. I was always bothered by how much value credit is given. That's the only thing you got. I mean, if you're an academic in some sense, well, it isn't the only thing you've got, but it feels that way sometimes. But you got the actual, we're all gonna be dead soon. Mm -hmm. You got the joy of having created. Yeah. The, you know, the, the credit with Jan, uh, I've, I've talked to Jorgen Schmidhuber, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, the Turing Award given to uh, three people for deep learning. And you could say that a lot of other people should be on that list. It's the Nobel Prize question. Yeah, it's sad. It's sad and people like talking about it, but I feel like in the long arc of history, the only person who will be remembered is Einstein, Hitler, maybe Elon Musk. Mm -hmm. well, <laughs> and the yeah. rest of us are just like. <laughs> well, you know, someone asked me about immortality once and, and I said, and I stole this from somebody else, I don't remember who, but it was, you know, I asked him, what's your great grandfather's name? Any of them. Of course, they don't know. Most of us do not know. I mean, I'm not entirely sure. I know my grandparents' names, all my grandparents' names. I know what I called them, right? I don't know any of their middle names, for example. Um, 
didn't within living memory, so I could find out. Actually, my grandfather didn't know when he was born. I had no idea how old he was, right? But I definitely don't know who any of my great-grandparents are. So in some sense, immortality is doing something preferably positive so that your great-grandchildren know who you are, right? And that's kind of what you can hope for, which is very depressing in some ways. Uh, you can, I could turn it into something uplifting if you need me to, but Yeah, it's, can you do the work here? Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's simple, right? It doesn't matter. I don't know, have to know who my great-grandfather was to know that I wouldn't be here without him. Yeah. And I don't know who my great-grandchildren are, and certainly who my great-great-grandchildren are, and I'll probably never meet them, although I would very much like to. But hopefully I'll set the world in motion in such a way that their lives will be better than they would have been if I hadn't done that. Well, certainly they wouldn't have existed if I hadn't done the things that I did. So um, I think that's a good positive thing. You live on through other people. Are you afraid of death? I don't know if I'm afraid of death, but I don't like it. <laughs> That's another t-shirt. <laughs> uh, I mean, do you ponder it? Do you, uh, yes. do you think about the... The, the inevitability of oblivion? Yes. Uh, I do occasionally. Um, this feels like a very Russian conversation, actually. It's, it's very, um, yeah. <laughs> I will tell you a story, a very, uh, something that happened to me recently. <laughs> I, um, if you look very carefully, you will see I have a scar. Yes. Um, which, by the way, is an interesting story of its own about why people have half of their thyroid taken out. Some people get scars and some don't. Um, but anyway, I uh, I had half my thyroid taken out. The way I got there, by the way, is its own interesting story, but I won't go into it. Just suffice it to say, I did what I, I keep telling people you should never do, which is never go to the doctor unless you have to, because there's nothing good that's ever going to come out of a doctor's yeah. visit, right? So I went to the doctor to do look at one thing, this little bump I had on the side that I thought my, might be something bad because my mother made me. And I went there and he's like, oh, it's nothing. But by the way, your thyroid is huge. Can you yeah. breathe? Yes, I can breathe. Are you sure? Because it's pushing on your windpipe. You should be dead. Ah, right. So I ended right. up going there and uh, to get my, uh, to, to look at my thyroid, it was growing. I have what's called a goiter. Um, and he said, we're going to have to take it out at some point. When? Sometime before you're 85, probably. But if you wait till you're 85, that'll be really bad because you don't want to have surgery when you're 85 years old, uh, if you can help it. Um, certainly not the kind of surgery it takes to take out your, your thyroid. So um, I went there and uh, we decided, I would decide I would put it off until December 19th, because my birthday's December 18th. And I wanted to be able to say I made it to 49 or whatever. So I said, I'll wait till after my birthday. Um, in the, <laughs> interve in the si first six months of that, yeah. uh, nothing changed. Apparently in the next three months, it had grown, I hadn't noticed this at all. Mm -hmm. uh, I went and had surgery. They took out half of it. The other half is still there and it's working fine, by the way. I don't have to take a pill or anything like that. It's great. I'm in the hospital room and um, the um, doctor comes in. I've got these things in my arm. They're gonna, they're gonna do whatever, they're talking to me. And the anesthesiologist says, huh, your blood pressure's through the roof. Are you, do you have high blood pressure? I said, no, but I'm terrified of that helps you at all. Um, and the anesthetist, who's the nurse who supports the anesthesiologist, um, if I got that right, uh, said, oh, don't worry about it. I've just put some put some stuff in your IV. You're going to be feeling pretty good in a couple minutes. And I remember turning and saying, uh, well, I'm going to feel pretty good in a couple minutes. Next thing I know, there's this guy and he's moving my bed. And I have this, and he's talking to me and I have this distinct impression that I've met this guy and I should know what he's talking about. But I kind of like just don't, Mm -hmm. remember what just happened. And I look up and I see the tiles going by and I'm like, oh, it's just like in the movies where you see the tiles go by. Mm -hmm. And then I have this brief thought that I'm in an infinitely long warehouse and there's someone um, sitting next to me. And I remember thinking, oh, she's not talking to me. And then I'm back in the, the, the hospital bed. And in between the time where the tiles were going by and I got in the hospital bed, something like five hours had passed. Apparently, it had grown so much that it was a four and a half hour procedure instead of an hour long procedure. Mm -hmm. I lost a neck size and a half. It was pretty big. Apparently, it was as big as my heart. Why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because it's a hell of a story already. So. Between <laughs> tiles going by and me waking up in my hospital bed, no time passed. There was no sensation of time passed. When I go to sleep and I wake up in the morning, I have this feeling that time has passed, this feeling that something has physically changed about me. Nothing happened between the time they put the magic juice in me and the time that I woke up, nothing. By the way, my wife was there with me talking. Apparently I was also talking. 
I don't remember any of this, but luckily I didn't say anything I wouldn't normally say. My memory of it is I would talk to her and she would teleport around the room. Hmm. And then I accused her of witchcraft and that was the end of that. But she, <laughs> her point of view is I would start talking and then I would fall asleep and then I would wake up and leave off where I was before. I had no notion of any time passing. I kind of imagine that that's death. <laughs> yeah. Is the lack of sensation of time passing. And on the one hand, I am, uh, I don't know, soothed by the idea that I won't notice. On the other hand, I am very unhappy at the idea that I won't notice. So I don't know if I'm afraid of death, but I am completely sure that I don't like it and that I particularly would prefer to discover on my own whether immortality sucks um, and be able to make a decision about it. That's what I would prefer. You like uh, have a choice in the matter. Mm -hmm. I would like to have a choice in the matter. Well, again, on the Russian thing, I think uh, the finiteness of it is the thing that gives it uh, a little flavor, a little spice. So, well, in reinforcement out. learning, we believe that. That's why we have discount factors. Otherwise, it doesn't matter what you do. <laughs> Amen. Well, uh, let me one last question. Uh, sticking on the on the Russian theme, you talked about your great grandparents not remembering their their name. What do you think is the in this kind of uh, Markov chain that is life, mm -hmm. what, what do you think is the meaning of it all? What's the meaning of life? Well, in a world where um, eventually you won't know who your great grand, you won't know who your great grandchildren are, um, I am uh, reminded of a of something I heard once, or I read, I read once that I I really like, which is, it is well worth remembering that the entire universe, save for one trifling exception, is composed entirely of others. And I think that's the meaning of life. Charles, this is one of the best conversations I've ever had, and I get to see you tomorrow again to hang out with a, with a, with a who, who looks to be one of the most, uh, how should I say, interesting personalities that I'll ever get to meet with Michael Lipman. So I can't wait. I'm excited to have had this opportunity. Thank you for traveling all the way here. It was, it was amazing. I'm excited. I always love Georgia Tech. I'm excited to see with you being involved there what, what the future holds. So thank you for talking today. Thank you for having me. I enjoyed every minute of it. Thanks for listening to this conversation with Charles Isbell. And thank you to our sponsors, Neuro, the maker of functional sugar-free gum and mints that I used to give my brain a quick caffeine boost. Decoding Digital, a podcast on tech and entrepreneurship that I listen to and enjoy. Masterclass, online courses that I watch from some of the most amazing humans in history. And Cash App, the app I use to send money to friends for food and drinks. Please check out these sponsors in the description to get a discount and to support this podcast. If you enjoy this thing, subscribe on YouTube, review it with five stars on Apple Podcast, follow on Spotify, support on Patreon, or connect with me on Twitter at Lex Friedman. And now let me leave you with some poetic words from Martin Luther King Jr. There comes a time when people get tired of being pushed out of the glittering sunlight of life's July and left standing amid the piercing chill of an alpine November. Thank you for listening and hope to see you next time. Do you uh, think about your own mortality? Do you think about your death? Your dad is no longer with us. You're the the old wise sage <laughs> that I represents. Have, it's funny that uh, the, I've only, <laughs> Worried about death uh, once in this pandemic. I, although I've had two of my, I had a cousin who was seventy three, and my my uncle who's seventy four die in India during the pandemic, I, and, I, and I grieve them both from COVID. Um, like the fear of COVID really has only hit me only really literally once during this, and it wasn't for me. I, and I recognize it's irrational. So on the eve of the Santa Clara County zero prevalence study. Um, it it was it was a really interesting thing because so many people volunteered to help, and um, my 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 daughter, who's twenty, she was I guess was nineteen at the time, and my wife also volunteered to help with like various aspects of the study, 
And so the eve of the study, they were going to go out in public. And I didn't know what the death rate was because we hadn't done the study. Mm -hmm. And I suspected it was lower than people were saying, but I didn't know. I, I knew about the age gradient because I'd seen the Chinese data. Mm -hmm. And my, my daughter's young, but my wife is my age. And I didn't know the death rate. And I couldn't sleep the night before. Like, what if I'm putting my family, my kid, my, my daughter and my wife at risk because of some, some activity that I'm doing? Um, it was kind of, I don't know. I mean, it was so it's worried about the well being and of others. Yeah. Like when my, you look my, in the mirror, I, if I die, I die. I mean, like, I just, it's not, I, I again, I'm Christian, so I don't, death is not the end for me, uh, I, I believe. Um, and so I don't, I don't particularly worried about my own death, but I, I do. I mean, I just, I think we can't help, but we worry about the, the, the well being of our loved ones. So you mentioned, um, Going back to darkness, I'm Russian, so I like going back to darkness. Uh, <laughs> you suffer from depression, you consider suicide. Do you uh, ponder your own death these days? Do you think about your own mortality? Are you afraid of death? I definitely think about mortality. And am I afraid of my own death? It depends on the moment. Uh, <laughs> if I'm in the middle of a project, I definitely want to finish that project, man. Yeah. <laughs> 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 but um, I don't fear it so much. I fear leaving my kids or my wife um, and not being able to be there for them. That bothers me. Outside of that, I know that I put everything into what I, the life that I've lived. Like you said, there's always more, but like I've lived hard. I've <laughs> loved hard. Yeah. I've, every moment in my life, I've made connections and impacted people around me for the better. And this tracks back, which is crazy when we were doing the documentary and they're interviewing people through my whole life and the consistency of the themes of anyone like, Anything for Duffin, like just, sure, I'll fly in from Boston, all the, like these people, like all of, like, it was crazy. Like everybody had a story about me giving, like yeah. just over and over. And I didn't even really, it's, it's just the way you were. Yeah. But I've been all in. Mm -hmm. I don't have, like, I have a lot more I want to do, but I don't have things that regret have not done in like, I don't fear it. I don't fear it. Yeah, it's like the, I don't know if you know the Bukowski poem, go all the way. Otherwise, don't even try. Uh, it seems like you embody that poem and you've accomplished some incredible things and serve as an inspiration to a huge number of people. Chris, you're an amazing human being. I'm really honored that you would spend your valuable time with me. Thank you so much for talking with me today. It was incredible. I can't wait to check out all the cool stuff you've engineered <laughs> with Kabuki Strength. So I'm uh, obviously I love the I love strength. I love strength training. I love the idea of strength. I love the um, the equipment and the engineering approach that you take to strength. You're an incredible human, both on the things you've accomplished in terms of your own strength feats and uh, the kind of science and engineering you bring to the field uh, that many others could use. So thank you so much for talking today. Thanks for having me on. That was, uh, <laughs> that was quite the final thing. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thanks for listening to this conversation with Chris Duffin. And thank you to Headspace, Magic Spoon, Sun Basket, and Ladder. Check them out in the description to support this podcast. And now let me leave you with some words from Arnold Schwarzenegger. Strength does not come from winning. Your struggles develop your strengths. When you go through the hardship and decide not to surrender, that is strength. Thank you for listening and hope to see you next time. But if we look at the real worst case uh, analysis here is one day you're pretty young now, but that's not going to last very long. You're going to die one day. Is that something you think about? A little bit. Are you afraid of death? Well, I'm of the mindset of, let's make that a productivity hack. <laughs> I'm of the mindset of, um, 
<laughs> we need to confront that soon. Yeah. So let's do what we can now so that when we really confront and think about it, we're we're more likely to feel better about it. So in other words, like let's let's focus now on living and doing things in such a way that it, we're proud of so that when it really comes time to confront that, we're more likely to say like, okay, I feel kind of good about the situation. So what, uh, when you're laying on your deathbed, would you, in looking back, what would make you think like, oh, I did a, I did okay. I'm proud of that. Yeah. I optimized the hell out of that. That's a good, I mean, it's a good question to, the, to go backwards on. I mean, this, this is like David Brooks's uh, eulogy virtues versus resume virtues. Right. So his argument is that, uh, and that's another interesting DC area person. I keep thinking of, of interesting DC area people. All right. David Brooks is here too. <laughs> yeah. Um, you, he, his argument, he thinks eulogy virtues is, uh, so what we eulogize is different than what we promote on the resume. Uh, that's his whole thing now, right? His second mountain wrote the character, both these books are, he has this whole premise of there's like this professional phase and there's a phase of, of, uh, giving of yourself and sacrificing on behalf of other people. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Maybe it's all mixed together, right? You want to, I think living by a code is important, right? I mean, uh, this is something that's not emphasized enough. I always think of advice that my undergrad should be given that, that they're not given, especially at a place like Georgetown that has this like deep history of, you know, trying to promote human flourishing because of the Jesuit connection. Yeah. Uh, there's such, there's such a uh, resiliency and pride that comes out of living well even when it's hard like living according to a code living according to which which you know i think religion used to structure this for people and uh, but in its absence you need some sort of replacement but this uh even when things were soldiers get this a lot right they experience this a lot even when things were tough i was able to persist in living in this way that i knew was right even though it wasn't the easiest thing to do in the moment like fewer things give humans more resiliency like having done that your relationships were strong, right? Many people coming to your funeral is a standard. Like a lot of people are going to come to your funeral. Like, I mean, you matter to a lot of people. Yeah. And then maybe having done to, to the extent of whatever capabilities you are happen to be granted, you know, and they're different for different people. And some people can sprint real fast and some people can do math problems. Uh, try to actually do something of impact. I'll just uh, promise to give gift cards to anybody who shows up to the funeral. <laughs> You're going to hack it. <laughs> I'm going <laughs> to hack gonna, even the funeral. There's uh, going to be a lottery wheel you spin when you come in and someone <laughs> goes away with $10,000. For that. Well, let's talk a little bit about life and death. <laughs> I'm, I'm pro-life and anti-death. <laughs> well, you for, for, mo for most people, there's few <laughs> exceptions that I won't mention here. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm glad just like your dad, you're taking a stand against uh, death. Uh, you have, uh, by the way, you have a bunch of awesome music where you play piano online. Well, one of the songs that I believe you've written, uh, the lyrics go, by the way, I like the way it sounds. People should listen to it. It's awesome. I, I was, um, I considered, I probably will cover it. It's a good song. Uh, tell me why do you think it is a good thing that we all get old and die? It's one of the songs. I love the way it sounds, but let me ask you about death first. Do you think there's an element to death that's essential to give our life meaning? Like the fact that this no. thing ends? The <laughs> well, let me say, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, pleased and a little em em embarrassed you've been listening to that music I put online. Oh, that's awesome. One of my regrets in life recently is I would love to get time to really produce music well. Like I, I, I haven't touched my sequencer software in like five years. Yeah. Like I... I I would love to like rehearse and produce and, and edit and but the with a two year old baby yeah. and, and trying to create the singularity, there's no time. So I, I just made the decision to when I'm playing random shit in an off moment Just record it. Just just record it. Oh, just put it out there you. like like whatever. maybe it, if I'm unfortunate enough to die, maybe that can be input to the AGI when it tries to make an accurate mind upload of me, right? Death is bad. <laughs> I mean, that's very simple. It's baffling we should have to say that. I mean, of course, people can make meaning out of out of death. And if if someone is tortured, maybe they can make beautiful meaning out of that torture and write a beautiful poem about what it was like to be tortured, right? I mean, we we're very creative. We can we can milk beauty and positivity out of even the most horrible and and, and shitty things. But just because if I was tortured, I could write a good song about what it was like to be tortured doesn't make torture good. And just because people are able to derive meaning and value from death doesn't mean they wouldn't derive even better meaning and value from ongoing life w without death, which I very- Indefinite. 
yeah. to optimize. So Ernest Becker, I'm not sure if you're familiar with him, the philosopher, he wrote the book, Denial of Death, and his idea is that one of the core motivations of human beings is our terror of death, our fear of death. Uh, that's what makes us unique from cats. Cats are just surviving. They do not have a deep under, like um, cognizance, introspection that over the horizon is the end. And he says that, I mean, there's a terror management theory that just all these psychological experiments that show that basically this idea that all of human civilization, everything we create is kind of uh, trying to forget if even for a brief moment that we're going to die. When, when do you think humans understand that they're going to die? Is it learned early on also? Like, I don't know to, at what point, I mean, it's a, it's a question like, you know, at what point do you realize that, you know, what death really is? And I think most people don't actually realize what death is, right? I mean, most people believe that you go to heaven or something, right? Well, so the so. <laughs> to push back on that, what Ernest Becker says and um, Sheldon Solomon, all of those folks, and I find those ideas a little bit compelling, is that there is moments in life, early in life, a lot of this fun happens early in life, when you are, uh, when you do deeply experience the terror of this realization and all the things you think about, about religion, all those kinds of things that we kind of think about more like teenage years and later, we're talking about way earlier. No, it's like seven or eight years, something you, like that, yeah. You, you realize, holy crap, this is uh, like the mystery, the terror, like it's almost like you're a, a little prey, a little baby deer sitting in the darkness of the jungle of the woods, looking all around you, there's darkness full of terror. I mean, that's that realization says, okay, I'm gonna go, go back in the comfort of my mind where there is a, where there is a deep meaning, where there is a, maybe like, pretend I'm immortal in however way, ho however kind of idea I can construct to help me understand that I'm immortal. Religion helps with that, but you can, you can delude yourself in all kinds of ways, like lose yourself in the busyness of each day, have little goals in mind, all those kinds of things to think that it's gonna go on forever. And you kind of know you're gonna die, yeah, and it's gonna be sad, but you don't really understand that you're going to die. And so that's, that's their idea, and I, f I find that compelling because it does seem to be a core unique aspect of human nature that we were able to think that we're going, we're able to really understand that this life is finite. Uh, that seems okay. important. There's, there's a bunch of different things there. So first of all, I don't think there is a qualitative difference between, between us and cats in the term. I think the difference is that we just have a better long-term ability to predict, you know, in the long term, And so, we have a better understanding of how the world works, so we have better understanding of you know finiteness of life and things like that. So that, we have a, a better planning engine than cats. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, but perhaps, well, what's the motivation for for planning that? Well, far? I think it's just a side effect of the fact that we have just a better planning engine because it makes us, uh, as I said, you know, the essence of intelligence is the ability to predict, and so the because we're smarter. As a side effect, we also have this ability to kind of make predictions about our own. Uh, future existence or lack thereof. Okay. Um, you say religion uh, helps with that. I think religion hurts, actually. Um, it makes people worry about, like, you know, what's going to happen after their death, etc. If you believe that, you know, uh, you just don't exist after death, like, you know, it solves completely the problem, Wait, at you, least. You're saying if you don't believe in God, you don't worry about what happens after death? Yeah. I don't know. You only I, worry about, the, about uh, you know, this life, because that's the only one you have. I think it's well. I don't. I don't know if I were to say what Ernest Becker says, and I would say I agree with him more uh, than not. Is uh, you do deeply worry uh, if you if you believe there's no God, there's still a deep worry, like of the mystery of it all. Like, how does that make any sense? That it just ends. I don't think we can truly understand that this right. I mean, so much of our life, the consciousness, the ego is uh, invested in this in this being. And then- to, to, so, Science keeps bringing humanity down from its pedestal. And that's, yeah, that's just another, the, that's, another yes. example of it. That's wonderful. But for us individual humans, we don't like to be brought down from a pedestal. I'm you're fine saying with like, it. <laughs> what, but see, you're fine with it because, well, so what Ernest Becker would say is you're fine with it because that's just a more peaceful existence for you, but you're not really fine. You're hiding from, in fact, some of the people that experience the deepest trauma 
uh, that it, earlier in life, they often, before they seek extensive therapy, will say, that I'm fine. It's like uh, when you talk to people who are truly angry, how are you doing? I'm fine. The, qu the question is, what's going on? Now, I had I, a near-death experience. Yeah. I had a very bad uh, motorbike accident when I was yes. 17. So, and, uh, But that didn't have any impact on my reflection on that topic. So I'm, yeah. I'm basically just playing a bit of a devil's advocate, pushing back and wondering is it truly possible to accept death? And the flip side that's more interesting, I think, for AI and robotics is how important is it to have this as one of the suite of motivations is to uh, not just avoid falling off the roof or something like that, but ponder the, the end of the ride. Uh, if you listen to the Stoics, it's, uh, it's a great motivator. It adds a sense of urgency. So maybe to truly fear death or be cognizant of it might give uh, a deeper meaning and urgency to the moment to live fully. I may, I may, maybe I don't disagree with that. Uh, I mean, I think what motivates me here is, uh, you know, knowing more about about human nature. I mean, I think uh, human nature and human intelligence is a big mystery. It's a scientific mystery. Mm -hmm. Uh, in addition to, you know, philosophical and et cetera, but, you know, I'm a true believer in science. So, um, and, and, and I do have kind of a belief that for complex systems like, like the brain and the mind, the, the way to understand it is to try to reproduce it with, you know, artifacts that you build because you know what's essential to it. When you try to build it, you know the same way. Um, I've used this analogy before with you, I believe. Um, <clears throat> the same way we we only started to understand uh, aerodynamics when we started building airplanes, and that helped us understand how birds fly. Uh, you know, so I, I think there's kind of a, a similar process here where we don't have a theory of a full theory of intelligence, but building you know intelligent artifacts will help us perhaps develop some you know underlying theory that uh, encompasses not just artificial implements, but also uh, human and biological intelligence in general. So you're an interesting person to ask this question about sort of all kinds of different other intelligent entities or intelligences. What are your thoughts about kind of like the Turing or the Chinese room question? If we create an AI system that exhibits a lot of properties of intelligence and consciousness, Motivator. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Um, so you don't think uh, so th you think that's an artifact of evolution. So that's the kind of mind space evolution created that we're sort of almost obsessed about self preservation, yeah. some kind of genetic level. You don't think that's necessary to be r afraid of death. So not just a, a kind of sub goal of self preservation, just so you can keep doing the thing, but more like, fundamentally, sort of have the finite thing like this ends for you at some point interesting do, do i think it's necessary for what precisely for intelligence but also for consciousness so for those for both do you think really like a finite death and the fear of it is important so before i can answer before we can agree on whether it's necessary for intelligence or for consciousness, we should be clear on how we define those two words because sure. a lot of really smart people define them in very different ways. Right. I was in this on this panel with AI experts, and they couldn't they couldn't agree on how to define intelligence even. So I, I define intelligence simply as the ability to accomplish complex goals. I like a broad definition because again, I don't want to be a carbon chauvinist, right? And. Um, in that case, no, it certainly doesn't require fear of death. I, th I would say AlphaGo or AlphaZero is quite intelligent. Right. I don't think AlphaZero has any fear of being turned off because it doesn't understand the concept of, of it even. And, uh, and similarly, consciousness, I mean, you, you can certainly imagine a um, very simple kind of experience. If, 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 I mean, if certain plants have any kind of experience, I don't think they're very afraid of dying because <laughs> there's nothing they can do about it anyway much. So, so there wasn't that much value in, but more, more seriously, I, I think uh, if you ask not just about being conscious, but maybe having uh, 
what you would be, we, would, we might call an exciting life for you feel right. passion and, and, and really appreciate the, the things. Maybe there somehow, maybe there perhaps it does help having, uh, having that backdrop that, Hey, it's finite. You know, let's, let's make the most of this. Let's live to the fullest. So I mean, if you, if you, if you knew you were going to just live forever, do you think you would change your, yeah, I mean, in some perspective, it, it would be an incredibly boring life living forever. So in the sort of loose subjective terms that you said of something exciting and something in this that other humans would understand, I think is, yeah, it seems that the, the finiteness of it is important. Well, the good news I have for you then is based on what we understand about cosmology, <laughs> everything is in our universe is pro ultimately probably finite although although big crunch or bi uh or big uh what's the exp the infinite yeah expansion? we could have a big chill or a big, big crunch chill. or a big rip or death uh, the big snap or death bubbles <laughs> all of them are more than a billion years away so it, we we should we certainly have vastly more time than our ancestors thought but they're still still pretty hard to squeeze in an infinite number of compute cycles even though there are some loopholes that just might be possible, but I, I think, I, you know, some people like to say that you should live as if you're about to, you're going to die in five years or so. And that's sort of optimal. Maybe we, it's a good assumption. We should build our civilization as if <laughs> it's all finite to be honest. Yet there, I think what it hangs on the topic of whether we can convert consciousness into an yes. engineering problem. So exactly. like, is consciousness tied to our biology? Mm. Because the moment we can convert consciousness mm -hmm. into a digital form, then we can send it with that light sail to Alpha Centauri. Until then, a robot is not carrying anything except maybe some basic knowledge like Wikipedia. It's not carrying the flame of human consciousness. Mm. I have high hopes uh -huh. for converting consciousness into an engineering problem. In fact, I think it's not as difficult as people think. I'm like, I agree with that. I'm definitely in the camp that consciousness is a property of the algorithm and not a property of uh, brain structure. Um, the other fun, like the kinds of philosophical things we'd have to grab, grapple with is like, once you upload yourself, like you can hit control C, you know, like yeah. uh, it would be, wouldn't it be lovely to have like 10 copies of Alex Friedman and then like we could just interview everyone. <laughs> so this is, I mean, this is, I, I have to ask this question. It's a difficult one, which I don't think it'd be wonderful, first of all. Hmm. Um, sure. <laughs> so in the following way, and this has to do with immortality as well, mm -hmm. there's something about scarcity that creates value. Or um, there's a bunch of philosophers, Viktor Frankl, Bernard mm -hmm. Williams, Ernest Becker, they argue that death or the scarcity of life creates meaning. That mm -hmm. the reason we life is beautiful the reason so many moments of experience of uh, uh of love or delicious food all those things are made delicious because they're finite because they end and because we don't have that many of them and there's a kind of worry that if we extend the human lifespan if we achieve immortality or if we god forbid clone uh me <laughs> multiple times, then you lose the richness of what it means to have this life, to have this experience. Is that mm. worry you at all? Do you think there's some aspect to which death does in fact give meaning to life? I guess like the one historical parallel, and like this might be a bit unfair, is that you know there have been philosophers that say that have said things like you know war gives like meaning to human collectives, and yeah. the struggle for supremacy between you know nations and races is this like big driver of progress that like that ensures that ev that everyone strives to be their best. And, um, you know, of course, uh, this viewpoint got into the head of a crazy Austrian guy and 20 years later, his soldiers were shooting at my grandparents. Um, so, you know, these days we don't really have that, but yet f life still feels meaningful. There's, we've still found other ways to, uh, or the, like, there's still a, a striving for technological progress. There's still, um, you know, a, str a, a striving for self-improvement in general. And it turns out that, you know, you don't actually need to have existential conflicts in order to, um, in order to have that. Now, maybe you need conflict, but we have other kinds of conflict, right? Like we have, you know, competition between businesses, competition between political ideologies, competition be between projects. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, these are 
like whatever what whatever the psychological needs are like they're just our substitutes for it so yeah, i and- guess like yeah so if we yeah I'm trying to say, I, I feel like once we start living to two, to the age of uh, 200, then like I'm just intuitively expecting that we'll see sub, like substitutes emerge in the same way. Yeah, that the, will will create conflicts of other sorts that lead to less human suffering than mm-hmm. wars do. Like it, we'll we'll just start playing Diablo four, five, six, and because you die in video games, so maybe we'll get some of the inkling of scarcity through the activities we partake in as opposed mm-hmm. to our own body dying. I mean, I feel shitty when I, uh, like you can, the, you, I remember in Diablo three, you can play in hardcore mode mm. where if you die in the game, your character's dead. Mm-hmm. So maybe we'll get <laughs> yeah, the, we'll the the richness of mm-hmm. like what that we currently get from life by having like little artificial versions of so, ourselves that die. Interestingly enough, as I've just like personally, spent more time in this world i've started realizing that you know there is a concept of like real fight ni- finiteness that still like exists and it might even still be a thing that provides meaning that doesn't require anyone to actually die mm. like for example like how many people from middle school or even high school that are, you know, in, in yours like do you still talk to regularly I um, happen to be close friends with like four mm. or five of them. Okay, well, like in my case, the answer is zero for middle school and two for high school. <laughs> but you're right, it, right? It, it, it like, dropped uh, exactly. It dropped a lot, zero. right? And so, yeah. like, there's a lot of these just like relationships that end up being very finite. Um, yeah. A person changes their. I feel like a person changes enough of their worldview after 25 years. Was that there even a study about this? Something like a person and themselves 25 years later are about as different as like two different peop- uh, yeah. people or something like this. Um, so, you know, like, I mean, just like you can have conflict without bloodshed, I think, um, you know, you can, you can have finiteness and even, you know, the, the necessary sor- sorrows of uh, finiteness that give meaning without like literally any anyone having to end their life. And hopefully if we do extend our life, we'll mm-hmm. figure out ways to extend the period of time where there's newer, neuroplasticity yes. to where we could change our worldviews mm-hmm. continually throughout that time. So you can Absolutely. have these different phases of life. Okay, let's t- talk about one of the most challenging things. Mm-hmm. One, one of the things I unfortunately am very afraid of being human, allegedly. You wrote an essay on death and consciousness in which you write a note Certainly the fear of death has been one of the greatest driving forces in the history of thought and in the formation of the character of civilization, and yet it is under acknowledged. The great book on the subject, The Denial of Death by Ernest Becker deserves a reconsideration. I'm Russian, so I have to ask you about this. What's the role of death in life? See, You would have enjoyed coming to our house because uh, <laughs> my wife is Russian, and we also awesome. have we have a piano of such spectacular qualities. You wouldn't, you would have freaked out. If you played the classical piano. But anyway, yeah. let's, we'll let all that go. <laughs> so um, the context in which I, I remember that essay, uh, sort of, this was from maybe the '90s or something, yeah. and um, I used to publish in a journal called the Journal of Consciousness Studies because I was. I was interested in these endless debates about consciousness and science, uh, which uh, certainly continue today. Mm-hmm. And I was interested in how the fear of death and the denial of death played into different philosophical approaches to consciousness. Mm-hmm. Because I, uh, I think on the one hand, uh the sort of sentimental school of dualism meaning the feeling that there's something apart from the physical brain some kind of soul or something else is obviously motivated in a sense by a hope that that whatever whatever that is will survive death and continue and that's a very core aspect of a lot of the world religions not all of them not not really but you know uh most of them um the thing I noticed is that the the opposite of those, which might be the sort of hardcore, no, the brain's a computer and that's it, in a sense, we're 
motivated in the same way with a remarkably similar chain of of of, uh, of arguments, which is, no, uh, the brain's a computer, and I'm going to figure it out in my lifetime and upload it, upload myself, and I'll live forever. <laughs> uh, that's interesting. Yeah, that, so, that's that's like the implied thought, right? Yeah, and so it's kind of this. In a funny way, it's it's the same thing. It, it, it's uh, um, it's peculiar that you to notice that these people who would appear to be opposites in character <laughs> and yeah. cultural references and uh, uh, and in their ideas actually are remarkably similar. And and, and to, to to an incredible degree, the sort of hardcore uh, computationalist idea of, about uh, the brain has turned into medieval Christianity. With together, like there's the there are the people who are afraid that if you have the wrong thought, you'll piss off the super AIs of the future who will come back and zap you, and and all that stuff. Yeah, uh, it's like it's really it's really turned into medieval Christianity all over again. Uh, this is so the Ernest Becker's idea that death. The fear of death is the warm at the core, which is like that. That's the that's the core motivator of everything we see humans have created. The question is if that fear of mortality is somehow core, is like a prerequisite. Mm. Uh, so to what you what you just you just moved across this vast cultural chasm. Uh, that separates me from most of my colleagues in a way, and I can't answer what you just said on the level without yes. this huge deconstruction. Yes. Should I do it? Yes, what's the chasm? Okay. Let us travel across this vast chasm. Okay, I don't believe in AI. I don't think there's any AI. There's just algorithms. We make them. We control them. Now, uh, they're tools. They're not creatures. Now, yes. th this is something that rubs a lot of people the wrong way, and don't I know it. When I was young, my main mentor was Marvin Minsky, who's the principal author of the computer as creature rhetoric that we still use. Uh, he was the first person to have the idea at all, but he certainly populated the AI culture with most of its tropes, I would say, because uh, a lot of the stuff people will say, oh, did you hear this new idea about AI? And I'm like, yeah, I heard it in 1978. Sure. Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> So Marvin was really the person. And uh, Marvin and I used to argue all the time about the stuff because I always rejected it. And of all of his, um, of all of his, uh, I, I wasn't formally his student, but I, uh, I worked for him as a researcher, but of, of all of his students and student-like people, <laughs> of his young adoptees, um, I think I was the one who argued with him about this stuff in particular, and he loved it. Yeah, I would have loved to hear that conversation. It was fun. Did you ever converge to a place? Oh no, no. So the, the very last time I saw him, he was quite frail, and and uh, I, I was in uh, in in Boston, and I was going to the old house in Brookline, his amazing house. And one of our mutual friends said, "Hey, listen, Marvin's so frail. Don't do the argument with him. <laughs> Don't argue about AI, yeah. you know." And so I said, "But Marvin loves that." And so I showed up, and he's like, you know, "He was frail." He looked up and he said, "Are you ready to argue?" <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's such an amazing person. For that. <laughs> so um, <laughs> it's hard to summarize this because it's decades of stuff. The first thing to say is that nobody can claim absolute knowledge about whether somebody or something else is conscious or not. Uh, th this is all a matter of faith. And in fact, um, I think the whole idea of faith needs to be updated. So it's not about God, but it's just about stuff in the universe. We, we have faith in each other being conscious. And then um, I used to frame this as a thing called the circle of empathy in my old papers. And then... Um, it turned into a thing for the animal rights movement too. I noticed Peter Singer using it. I don't know if it was coincident or, but, but anyway, we there's this idea that you draw a circle around yourself and the stuff inside is more like you, might be conscious, might be deserving of your empathy, of your consideration, and the stuff outside the circle isn't. Mm -hmm. And um, outside the circle might be a rock <laughs> or, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, so, uh, and that circle is fundamentally based on faith. Well, like your faith no, in no, what it, is and what isn't. It, the thing about the circle is it can't be pure faith. It also has it's also a pragmatic decision, and this is where things get complicated. Mm -hmm. If you try to make it too big, you suffer from incompetence. 
if you say, I don't want to kill a bacteria, I will not brush my teeth. I don't know. Like, what do you do? Yeah. Like, you know, like th there's a there's a competence question where you do have to draw the line. People who make it too small become cruel. People are so clannish and political and so worried about themselves ending up on the bottom of society that they are always ready to gang up on some designated group. And so there's always these people who are being trying, we're always trying to shove somebody out of the circle. Mm -hmm. And so, so aren't you shoving AI outside the circle? Well, give me a second. All right. So, so <laughs> there's a pragmatic consideration here. Yes. And so, uh, and, and, uh, the, the biggest questions are probably fetuses and animals lately, but AI is getting there. Now with AI, I think, uh, and I've had this discussion so many times, people would say, but aren't you afraid if you exclude AI, you'd be cruel to some consciousness. And then I would say, well, if you include AI, you make yourself, you you exclude yourself from being able to be a good engineer or designer, and so you, you're facing incompetence immediately. So, like, I really think we need to subordinate algorithms and be much more skeptical of 